The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length and limitations in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. As a reminder to members, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you are not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. And consistent with house rules, staff will only mute members as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum, and I now recognize myself for opening remarks. Pursuant to notice, we meet today to continue evaluation of the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan and the series of policies from the past 20 years that led to the events of August 2021. I want to take a moment to thank our distinguished panelists for joining us for this virtual hearing, our second in a series of exploring U.S. policy in, Af in Afghanistan. And thanks to all of you for your service to our country. For the past almost 20 years since Americans first deployed to Afghanistan, our troops and those of our allies have performed heroically. And I also want to recognize the contributions and the sacrifice of all of our diplomats and development professionals who also served in Afghanistan since 2001. Now, I'm holding this hearing as part of this committee's oversight work exploring years of policy decisions related to Afghanistan that led to the events that unfolded this past August. Though the evacuation efforts started off precariously, that the administration was able to facilitate the evacuation of over 124,000 people in less than 20 days was an incredible effort and result. Now we must recognize that what we saw unfold in Kabul in August of 2021 wasn't simply about 20 days, but was the culmination of two decades of policymaking. That includes changing our missions from defeating Al Qaeda to nation building and failing to keep the Taliban's offer of surrender. Decisions like diverting resources to Iraq, failing to effectively deal with Pakistan and safe havens in that country, or announcing a surge of troops based on counterinsurgency strategy when our goals and the goals of the Afghan government did not align. Decisions to continue night raids and drone strikes and making a deal with the Taliban that fundamentally altered the political landscape of this country. And the list goes on and on. There are 20 years of decisions and choices dating back to 2001 that led to the events of August 2021. In 2002, then President George W. Bush said, the history of military conflict in Afghanistan has been one of initial success, followed by long years of floundering and ultimate failure. We're not going to repeat that mistake. And yet, that has become the story of America's 20-year war effort in Afghanistan. And ultimately, we repeated that mistake. In 2008, President Obama referred to Afghanistan as quote, the good war. And then he served an additional 30,000 troops after conducting a review of Afghanistan policy, entrenching the United States further in the war. We had a new formulation, AFPAC, that recognized the link between our policies in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but failed to address those links. And while President Trump vocalized the frustration many Americans felt about the prolonged conflict, the forever war, the deal President Trump and Secretary Pompeo signed with the Taliban directly contributed to the destabilization that led to this summer's frantic withdrawal. Now, I want to be clear. This committee's oversight effort isn't simply to determine whether we should blame the Bush or Obama or Trump or Biden administrations. This committee seeks to understand and learn what went right, what went wrong over the course of 20 years, so that we don't again, repeat the mistakes of the past. How did a mission that was initially focused on dismantling Al-Qaeda 
turned into a 20-year nation-building exercise that ended ultimately with failure to build an Afghan nation. Why did successive administrations fail to recognize what was hiding in plain sight? That the progress we were told we were making or that the corners we were told we were turning was really based not on fact, but on hope. On the hope that a trillion dollars in assistance was building a capable military, a resilient health and education system, and irreversible progress on girls' and women's rights. Those hopes did not realize, and the cost of our mistakes were borne by 2,461 U.S. service members and more than 100,000 Afghans, including more than 47,000 Afghan civilians killed in the conflict. This doesn't capture the thousands of Americans, Afghans, and coalition partner countries' families affected by the war. So I want to again thank the witnesses for helping us take this retrospective look at some of the policies that got us here and what we could have done differently so that we won't ever again repeat the mistakes of the past. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. McCall, for his opening statements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, hope this is the second what I hope will be uh, many public hearings and briefings as we begin the investigation into President Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan. President Biden and officials in his administration have continued to push the notion that only two options were available in Afghanistan. One, to fully withdraw in this chaotic and bloody way, or two, keep tens of thousands of troops on the ground indefinitely. But I believe that is a false um, premise. First, President Biden could have listened to his top generals who advised him to leave a small counterterrorism force behind. This also would have enabled us to keep thousands of NATO troops. And no matter what the president has claimed in the media, it's abundantly clear that General Milley, McKenzie, and Miller all advised against a full withdrawal before the evacuation began. But even if the president wanted to withdraw all U.S. troops, he could have listened to Republicans and Democrats in the Congress, including many on this committee, who have begged him for months to take the necessary steps to mitigate the fallout our withdrawal would cause. As one of our witnesses, Ambassador Crocker, and I wrote in our New York Times op-ed on May 1st, or I'm sorry, May the 4th, before the United States completed our withdrawal, it was vital that President Biden, one, set up agreements with neighboring countries to provide ISR capabilities, two, develop a clear strategy for protecting our embassy staff and aid workers in order to continue our humanitarian assistance programs, three, honor the promises we made to our Afghan partners that fought alongside our troops, including our interpreters, through the special immigrant visa program. But he did none of that. Instead, President Biden allowed politics and bad judgment to dictate our national security rather than conditions on the ground. And he abdicated his responsibility as commander in chief by refusing to take responsibility for his misguided decisions and blaming everyone but himself. He buried his head in the sand while we all watched Afghanistan crumble before our very eyes. And as a result of President Biden's failed leadership, 13 American service members were killed, with 18 more wounded. We have abandoned hundreds of American citizens and lawful permanent residents behind enemy lines. And we have left thousands of our Afghan partners behind, all with a bullseye on their backs and all at the mercy of the Taliban. If they are caught, they will surely be executed. In other words, as General Milley said recently, our withdrawal from Afghanistan was a, quote, strategic failure. This disaster has also created a very real long-term threat to our national security. The Director of National Intelligence admitted our intelligence capabilities have been diminished. The Deputy Director of the CIA and the Director of Defense Intelligence Agency have said that Al-Qaeda could develop capabilities to strike the U.S. homeland within one to two years. And General McKenzie said before Congress last week that it is, quote, yet to be seen if we can't prevent al-Qaeda and ISIS from using Afghanistan to launch terror attacks into the United States and our allies. And on top of that, we have angered our allies, abandoned our partners, and emboldened our adversaries. 
As General Milley also said last week, our credibility is being, quote, intensely reviewed by both our allies and adversaries. And, quote, damaged is one word that could be used for our standing in the world. So much is left to be uncovered, and there are many lessons to be learned from this debacle. Uh, and the last 20 years, Mr. Chairman, as you pointed out, Ambassador Crocker, you and I met in Kabul during the surge when we had 100,000 troops on the ground. I remember, remember visiting Kandahar and the birthplace of the Taliban when Mullah Omar was hiding in Pakistan. You and I agreed that a light footprint of 2,500 Americans plus NATO forces is a small price to pay for stability and that any withdrawal should be, have been conditions based. So I deeply appreciate you, sir, and our other witnesses for appearing here today to pr provide us uh, with your insight. And Mr. Chairman, let me once again thank you for having uh, this hearing, and I look forward to many more in the future. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now will turn to the chair of the subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and Nonproliferation, uh, Chairman Ami Berra, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the witnesses for agreeing to to be here in front of the, the subcommittee or in front of the committee. Obviously, there's a wealth of knowledge of um, the past 20 years in Afghanistan. There'll be lots of debate on um, the merits of the withdrawal, how it was executed, so forth. But with the expertise um, on this panel, I think it's really important for us to understand why the Afghan security forces collapsed as quickly as they did after 20 years of investment, why the, the government collapsed. And the reason why I couch that is we are where we are right now, and we have to think about, you know, both diplomatically and from a counterterrorism perspective, the best way we approach Afghanistan and the region, how we work with the countries, you know, in Central Asia, you know, to the extent we can work with Pakistan to try to hold some semblance of, you know, an Afghanistan together so it doesn't become a belt state that can harbor, um, you know, terrorists, et cetera. So I look forward to that testimony. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Chair Barra. And now I'll turn to the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for one minute. Mr. Shabbat, are you there? Yes, yes, thank you. We had some technical difficulties here. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a lot of blame to go around for why the United States didn't ultimately succeed in Afghanistan. But all the uh, missteps of previous administrations, in my view, pale in comparison to the Biden administration's bungled pullout and its callous disregard for the resulting human suffering. It's surely one of the worst foreign affairs disasters in American history. The Biden administration has tried any number of excuses and pointed fingers of blame at everyone but itself. But the facts are the facts. The Taliban are in charge. Afghan women are living in a state of quasi-slavery. Afghanistan is once again a haven for terrorists. And those terrorists now have our weapons to use against us and our allies. Our allies don't trust us as much, and our enemies don't fear us as much. So as we look back over the last 20 years, it's important to remember that while past presidents talked about leaving, President Biden actually did it and he owns the consequences. And I yield back. Thank you, ranking member. I'll now introduce our distinguished panel of witnesses. The Honorable Richard L. Armitage served as Deputy Secretary of State from March 2001 through February of 2005 under President George W. Bush. The Lieutenant General Herbert Raymond McMaster served as National Security Advisor from February 2017 to April 2018 under President Donald Trump. The Honorable Ryan C. Crocker, a former career Foreign Service Officer, serving six times in America, as an American Ambassador to Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait, Lebanon, and Afghanistan. And the Honorable Douglas E. Lute, served in 2009 under President Barack Obama as the senior official responsible for South Asia on the National Security Council 2013 to 2017 as the U.S. Ambassador 
to NATO. We are all very honored to have you testify before the House Foreign Affairs Committee. You will have five minutes to deliver your opening remarks. And without objection, your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. I'll now recognize the witnesses uh, for their testimony. And I'll start with Mr. Armitage. You are now recognized. We have Mr. Armitage. You're on mute. Please unmute. Can you hear me now, Chairman? Now I hear you. I apologize, sir. Very briefly, thank you for submitting our opening statements along with my colleagues. This is not my first rodeo. Uh, so with your permission, I'll let you get about your job, which is asking questions, and I'll do the best I can to try to answer your question. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. McMaster, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Meeks, Representative McCall, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be with you and my friends on this panel. I focused my statement for the record on describing the causes of our self-defeat in Afghanistan based on strategic narcissism and self-delusion. But I hope that we might also discuss the likely long-term consequences associated with the catastrophe there and what we might do to mitigate those consequences and begin to recover. The humanitarian security and political disasters in Afghanistan are just beginning. The Taliban are reimposing brutal Sharia. More Afghans will suffer. The numbers of refugees will grow. The ready-made hostage crisis that resulted from, a leaving, for, from leaving American and allied citizens behind, as well as those Afghans who fought to preserve their freedom, will continue. Jihadist terrorists are gaining psychological, financial, and physical strength. A victory for the Taliban is a victory for jihadist terrorists everywhere, but especially for those based in South and Central Asia. The Haqqani Network and Al-Qaeda are completely intertwined with the Taliban. They and other terrorist organizations are celebrating a jihadist victory over the world's superpower. They're using our surrender and withdrawal as ISIS used the establishment of the Islamic State in 2014 after our complete withdrawal from Iraq in December 2011 to recruit more to the cause from far beyond their emirate in Afghanistan. The Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan will give jihadists unfettered access to the lucrative narcotics trade, other illicit enterprises, state revenue, and diverted international assistance. But a jihadist terrorist organizations uh, are, are not, not only growing larger in numbers, uh, more confident and richer, they are also becoming more destructive. Our humiliating withdrawal left terrorists with billions of dollars of weapons. Those weapons will be shared among the over 20 U.S. designated terrorist organizations in the terrorist ecosystem across Afghanistan and Pakistan. Because some of those groups have already turned against the nuclear-armed Pakistani army and government, it is not difficult to imagine terrorists gaining access to the most destructive weapons on Earth. It is for these reasons that I believe our self-defeat in Afghanistan and our broader disengagement from the fight against jihadist terrorists internationally in recent months has made jihadist terrorists more dangerous today than they were on 10 September 2001. Finally, we are already witnessing the political dimension of our lost war. From Tehran to Moscow to Beijing to Pyongyang, our adversaries are emboldened and our friends and allies doubt that we are trustworthy. Thank you for the privilege of being with you. I believe that this committee's oversight role may be more important than ever because the humanitarian, security, and political disaster in Afghanistan is the result of incompetence across multiple administrations. Unless the American people and their representatives in Congress demand better from our leaders, 
the prospect of learning from our searing experience in South Asia, rebuilding our strategic competence, and effacing the stain of 2021 will remain dim. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Ambassador Crocker for five minutes. You're on mute. Ambassador Crocker, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Now I hear you. I apologize. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McCall, I had the uh, privilege to see post 9-11 Afghanistan from different perspectives in different years. Um, I reopened our embassy in, uh, in Kabul in the first week of January 2002. Uh, as it happens, it was Secretary Armitage who sent me there to do that. Um, uh, we never had a doubt about why we were there with that embassy. Uh, it was about America's security in its homeland. That never again would uh, any kind of element be able to form in Afghanistan that could strike us as we were struck on 9-11. Uh, that was the case then. That was the case when I returned as ambassador in 2011, 2012. Uh, so I don't think there was ever really a serious question as to why we were there. What was our goal? What was our end that we sought? The differences came over how to do it. What are the means and ways? Uh, when I arrived, 800,000 students in Afghan schools, all of them boys. Uh, when I left in 2012, uh, the number was roughly 8 million, some 35% girls. Uh, was that a means to our end? Yes, to have an educated population, uh, both genders, uh, growing up, coming of age in a free, um, an environment of free speech and, and free media access. Uh, these things take a long time for fruition. Um, and here I would just jump ahead to... I, I think our ultimate cause of failure here and elsewhere, uh, a lack of strategic patience. We are, we are not good at the long haul. That is not how we built our own country. Uh, uh, we want results. We want them now. If we don't get them, uh, we'll move on to something else. And, and I think Afghanistan has now emerged as, sadly, uh, the poster child for that failure of patience. I, I don't see it as gross incompetence. Um, I don't see it as a, a confused appreciation of why we were there. We were there to defend America's security at home, defending it forward in Afghanistan. But we ran out of patience. Uh, this has bedeviled uh, American foreign policy more than once. Uh, and indeed, it has fostered a culture long before America assumed the uh, role on the international stage that we see today. Um, our enemies have come to count on our strategic impatience and our allies to fear it. Uh, and that is what we're dealing with today. Uh, what I would say as we look forward or attempt to look forward, uh, that uh, uh, we have to understand that our dangers have increased. Uh, uh, Pakistan next door, I was ambassador there for three years. We saw uh, the Pakistanis consistently gave safe haven to uh, the Taliban, uh, some of his most nefarious elements. Why? As they said it to me, it's their narrative. We know you're going to walk out one day. You walked out on us after the Soviet defeat. You'll walk out, us on, out on us again, and we will not be left with the Taliban as our mortal enemy. Uh, so they probably had 15 minutes of high-fiving uh, uh, as events proved them right that we would go but only 15 minutes because they're scared. Uh, the Taliban so-called victory has fueled Islamic extremists everywhere and certainly in Pakistan, where the Pakistani Taliban aim at the overthrow of the government in Islamabad, not in Kabul. And I understand there is already a conversation underway as the Pakistanis try to address a greatly enhanced threat to their own stability and security as, uh, as the Taliban hold uh, increases and the Taliban message 
uh, flows through the entire uh, Islamic world where extremist groups feel emboldened. So uh, how we got there is important. What do we do now? That's even more important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, I now recognize uh, Ambassador Luke. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, Ranking Member, uh, members of the committee, thanks for this opportunity to appear before you today to discuss this important topic. In this brief statement, I'll uh, offer some thoughts on context for your work uh, and, uh, and the committee's work going forward, uh, and also outline several lessons uh, that I take away from U.S. involvement. Uh, first of all, context. In the face of the tra tragic events of the last several weeks, uh, especially the collapse of the government, uh, the evacuation that followed, including the suicide attack in Kabul that tragically killed 13 Americans and over 150 Afghan civilians, it'd be natural to focus on the near term, the last several weeks, and ask ourselves, how did we come to this end? I believe, however, a more powerful, more useful assessment would entail a deeper and broader view. Uh, this defeat in Afghanistan, Chairman, as you mentioned, did not happen in the last 20 days or the last 20 weeks. Uh, it's the cumulative effect of the last 20 years. And despite all our efforts, all the sacrifices of our nation, our NATO allies and partners, and most significantly, the Afghan people, we were unable to build an Afghan state that was self-sustainable and able to win legitimacy, sufficient legitimacy, among the Afghan people. We need to understand why. And then also on context, there may be a tendency to confine this assessment narrowly uh, only to Afghanistan itself. The full story, however, includes a much broader picture. The role of regional players, especially Pakistan, the capabilities and mindset resident in our military, intelligence community, and State Department, uh, as well as our ability to integrate these parts into a coherent whole, and the policymaking processes across four presidential administrations here in Washington. Only a deep and broad examination will render a better understanding of how our involvement in Afghanistan ended as it did. Uh, let me just tick off an offer for the committee several lessons. There'll be many lessons that come out of your examination and, and the histories that will follow. And let me just offer four that have to do primarily with forming and executing strategy. Um, for the purposes of this conversation, I define strategy as the alignment of ends, ways, and means over time. That is the alignment of what we aim to achieve, the ends, with how we intend to do that, the ways, and ultimately the resources, the means required to do that work. If there are disconnects between ends, ways, and means, we do not have an effective strategy. And I'm, uh, my first observation is there were often disconnects between ends, ways, and means. First, when we're setting our national goals, we must have a realistic picture of what's possible in the specific setting. A deep understanding of the setting must be grounded in facts, not emotions, hope, or aspirations. We should apply a healthy dose of humility as to what is possible in places as complex and as foreign as Afghanistan. In 2001, when we initially intervened, Afghanistan was a failed state. It was the fourth poorest country in the world, it had virtually no state institutions. It was deeply fragmented politically and largely isolated from the outside world. Setting lofty, ambitious goals to build a state with a strong central government in such a setting may have been beyond our capabilities from the outset in 2001, 2002. Second, once we set realistic goals, we must assemble the resources required. For the first seven or eight years of our experience in Afghanistan, we under-resourced the effort, especially as we prioritized the war in Iraq beginning in 2003. During the same period, that same initial seven or eight years, the Taliban regrouped and mounted a strong insurgency against the government and against our presence. As years passed, this gap between our goals and the resources we applied persisted and significantly decreased our prospects for success. Third, among the resources we did assemble, and commit to Afghanistan, we tended to over-rely on military means, often providing too few or discounting the importance of political, diplomatic, and development resources. We very seldom achieved a balanced whole-of-government approach. We talk a good game about whole-of-government, but we seldom achieve it. 
And in the end, the collapse in Afghanistan proved to be as much a political collapse as a military. And yet it was the political arm that, I, in my view, we discounted over time. Fourth and finally, we should remember on the positive front, uh, and we should value the contribution uh, of others. Uh, our NATO allies in particular, tonight I just happened to be seated at the U.S. mission in NATO where I'm doing some other work. Uh, but our NATO allies invoked Article 5, uh, the Collective Defense Clause of the NATO Treaty, on the day after 9-11. Uh, they then stayed with us for these 20 years on the battlefield, losing over uh, 1,000 killed in action. Important resources came from the UN, from the European Union, the World Bank, the IMF, um, and countless non-governmental organizations. We are the most powerful country in the world, but we cannot take and sustain interventions like Afghanistan alone. The lesson here is clear. Force cannot do all that needs doing, and all that needs doing cannot be done alone. Finally, one final point on lessons. Uh, I think most of us on the panel grew up in, a, in an environment, a culture, a military culture, a State Department culture, where we constantly try to harvest lessons. And I, I would guess that my fellow panelists may agree with me that there's a significant difference between lessons and lessons learned. It's important to define the lessons as your committee is doing uh, with these hearings such as today, but it's even more significant to actually learn those lessons. And by learn, I mean adapting organizations, adapting processes, adapting structures, adapting budgets, so that the lessons actually mean something. Only then will we honor fully the sacrifices of many in Afghanistan over the past 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you all for your testimony. Uh, I'll now recognize members for five minutes each, pursuant to the House rules, and all time yielded is for the purpose of questioning our witnesses. I'm going to recognize uh, members by committee seniority, alternating between Democrats and Republicans. Please note that I will be fairly strict with enforcing the five minute time limitation for questioning so that everybody gets an opportunity to ask a question. I will start by recognizing uh, myself for five minutes. You know, one of the things in reading everyone's wit uh, written statements, uh, there was one overlapping feature that played a central role, I think, uh, on the ending. And uh, that was uh, the deal, President Trump's Taliban deal, whether it was forcing the release of 5,000 prisoners, the exclusion of the Afghan government from the overall negotiation, or failing to obtain a clear commitment to separate from Al Qaeda. So I guess I'll ask maybe first, uh, uh, Mr. McMaster, how do you think things might have been different had the deal never that was agreed to by uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and Donald Trump uh, never happened? Well, I, I think we have to call it what it is. It was a capitulation agreement based on concession after concession. Uh, that, that not only uh, served our overall purpose, which became the priority of withdrawing from Afghanistan, but had the effect of actually strengthening the Taliban and weakening the Afghan government security forces uh, on the way out. And, and we're, we're talking uh, about uh, about strategic competence, and and this is this is the, uh, really a paragon or, or or an extreme example of incompetence that I think essentially was doubling down on the mistakes that really began in the Obama administration. If you remember uh, when President Obama announced the reinforced security effort in Afghanistan in 2010, he announced the withdrawal of troops at the same time and then said, oh, and let's negotiate it with the Taliban. Well, how does that work to negotiate with your enemy after you give them the timeline for your withdrawal? The Trump administration, I think, initially administering a corrective to that approach in the August 2017 policy, abandoned it, as I mentioned, doubled down on that, that fundamental flaw of a disconnect between what we're doing militarily and what we're trying to achieve politically. And so I think this was, uh, you know, it shouldn't be surprising. It was a setup uh, for, for the tremendous failure that we've just witnessed. Now, of course, the Biden administration had some agency over this, could have reversed it, could have provided a corrective, but, but chose not to. So um, but I, I, again, see this as, as a fundamental flaw across multiple administrations of not integrating uh, our elements of power to achieve our objectives. On that point, let me just go to Ambassador Luke right now, who was in the Obama administration during the time of uh, 
the 2011 bin Laden raid, which was, in my opinion, another missed opportunity to find a way to leave Afghanistan. Now, we understand that there was an effort underway to open this channel with the Taliban to do just that, that predated the bin Laden's killing. What can you tell us about how the Obama administration saw the killing of bin Laden as it related to ending the fighting in Afghanistan and the negotiation channel that was established during the Obama administration? Well, Chairman, you're right. Uh, President Obama approved the surge of 30,000 U.S. troops and 10,000 other than U.S. troops, so a total of 40, uh, in December of 2009, as, uh, as HR just laid out. Uh, and he did that at West Point. The next month, uh, inside the White House, we began to explore what we considered possible openings with the Taliban. There were a lot of rumors, some of them false, uh, but there were a lot of threads of possibility. Uh, that the Taliban might want to talk to the United States. That process developed uh, through uh, 2010, and by November of 2010, three administration officials authorized by President Obama met with then the head of the Taliban political office based in Doha, Qatar, uh, in uh, Munich, Germany, uh, assisted by the German intelligence service. So parallel to the troop surge, there was an effort uh, to try to explore there was nothing certain about this or even likely about this in terms of in terms of success. But we did have a, a concerted effort to explore openings, diplomatic openings with the Taliban in, in an effort to complement and to bring into alignment the military and the political uh, dimensions of this. With the killing of bin Laden uh, in 2011, uh, that was followed just a couple months later. Uh, by way of the, uh, the, the end of the surge itself, the beginning of the end of, uh, of the surge itself, and our troop levels began to taper off uh, in the summer and into the fall of 2011. So there was a linkage, although it wasn't anticipated, of course, that we would get bin Laden, uh, but there was a linkage between getting bin Laden, I think, in April of 2011 and the beginning of the end of the surge that followed. Let me get one other question into Ambassador Crocker. Uh, just as you, in your testimony, and I know in an interview in 2021, you criticized both the Trump and Biden administration policy, saying we ran out of place you just testified to in terms of our effort in Afghanistan. Uh, and you uh, have been clear that withdrawing now was the wrong move. So my question to you is, under what conditions or when exactly do you think it would have been the right time to withdraw? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I've tried to convey, um, patience is critical in these complex contingencies that we continue to face overseas. Uh, we talk about victory and defeat as though they were absolutes, winning and losing. I don't use those terms. I never have. Uh, there are conflicts that can be, that cannot be won in a classical sense, but can be managed. And that is where I think we were in Afghanistan. When I left Kabul in uh, the summer of 2012, we had over 100,000 U.S. troops on the ground. The Taliban was active, uh, but it held none of the 34 provincial capitals in Afghanistan. Uh, as Ambassador Lute noted, our troop levels uh, began dropping uh, uh, pretty quickly, so that by the time President Obama left office, it was somewhere over 10,000, 10% 10 of what it was uh, when I had been there. And those numbers continued to drop. And still, the Taliban held no provincial capitals. So it seemed to me that we were in a position where with a very modest force, 2,500 was probably too low, but uh, bump that up, say, to four to 5,000 plus uh, our NATO partners, uh, I think we could have managed that security problem indefinitely. And that may have been what it would take. You don't put a date on the calendar, uh, uh, that simply tells your adversary or your enemy how long he has to hold out for. Uh, and that is the irony, of course, as uh, General McMaster alluded to the uh, Trump administration saying in August of uh, 2017, it's not the calendar, it's conditions. Uh, so uh, again, I think we, we uh, threw away a, a chance uh, to further ensure the security of our homeland and indeed global security. Uh, with a very modest force. Uh, uh, the, much of America's power uh, is symbolic. 
uh, and the symbol of a U.S. military presence that was no longer engaged in combat uh, was itself a very powerful weapon. We just gave it up. Thank you. My time has expired. I now recognize Ranking Member McCall for his uh, questions. He's authorized. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, my conversations with National Security O'Brien and Secretary Pompeo, uh, the February agreement was always conditions based, uh, as has been mentioned. And it's hard for me to fathom a President Trump agreeing to an unconditional surrender to the Taliban. I just don't think that's in his DNA. But having said that, um, and I know there's a lot of blame to go around, but Ambassador Crocker, you know, you've served, uh, I want to thank you for your service in so many hot spots uh, in the region. Um, you know, the State Department's responsible for ordering the evacuation. Um, they did not take our advice in our New York Times op-ed. And they left many American citizens uh, behind, still some left today. And pretty much all of our Afghan partners will certainly face execution. Based on your uh, long-term experience, uh, how would you rate this evacuation? Well, it, it, it would be hard to uh, recall, I can't recall, um, uh, one that was um, more chaotic than the one we experienced in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, clearly, no one anticipated the, uh, the rapidity of the Taliban takeover. Um, certainly not, uh, I assume not, uh, our uh, folks on the ground. And obviously, the, uh, this will be the subject of, of, of further hearings, who knew what when. Um, uh, so I think I, having been through a, an evacuation or two, um, the fact that we did not wind up with a Tehran-like situation with our embassy seized, with our diplomats in it, um, uh, that took some foresight and action on the part of somebody just to ensure that it didn't get any worse than it already was. Uh, so, yes, we have uh, left, uh, as you know, sir, I'm on the board of No One Left Behind, a nonprofit that uh, has sought for some time to bring those who have served us and risked their lives doing so to safety in the United States through the Special Immigrant Visa Program. Well, we left literally thousands of them behind including their family members. Uh, so uh, in addition to the American citizens, which are obviously our first priority, uh, we left a lot of other folks behind. Uh, we left behind uh, Afghan women and girls who uh, heeded our call to step forward, get an education, run for parliament, join the military, start a business. Uh, you take those steps, we've got your back. Until we... And of course, now the Taliban flag is emblazoned on the embassy where you served and where we all visited so many times. But um, there's this talk of a new and improved Taliban that we can uh, normalize relationships with them. We can legitimize their government. Um, when I look at the makeup of the leadership, it's the same old cast of characters with strong ties to, to terrorism and Al Qaeda. Um, what would be your advice in ter to this administration? in terms of normalization of our relationship with the Taliban? Well, first, as a point of comparison, uh, the Taliban takeover in, in uh, the mid-90s is not analogous to what we're looking at now. I think a closer parallel would be the Iranian Revolution of 1979, uh, in which we were told by Iran's civilian leadership in the fall of 79, now is the time to come back in as the U.S., uh, um, they misread it because they had no idea what was going on in the, uh, uh, the inner circles of Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, I think that's what we're looking at now. Um, I think we are probably going to see something of a revolution within the Taliban. Uh, who leads? Uh, so we cannot predict what the Taliban is going to do next, in part, be large part, because they can't predict and I agree. My final question, uh, thank you, Ambassador, so much. Uh, General McMaster, over the horizon capability, lots has been talked about that. Um, that's our ISR capability, the Ambassador and I have been talking about for a while. I don't see how you can effectively do that out of, uh, you know, eight hours away uh, at Qatar or UAE. Uh, we, could, we couldn't even do a proper drone strike when we were on the ground. 
um, in Afghanistan. What is and now they're talking about partnering with Russia to use their bases in Central Asia as our counterterrorism mission. What are your thoughts on this ISR capability? Thank you, Representative McCall. I, it's a it's a pipe dream. Uh, it, it's a it is a uh, uh, it, it is these are raids that can be conducted against obvious targets, but of course. Now you have the Taliban in control, in control of large urban areas in which they're intermingled with civilian populations, which makes the, the likelihood of a significant amount of collateral damage uh, a, a, a big risk on, on any strike, as we saw with the, uh, with the, the mistaken strike uh, after, the, after the mass murder attack against our, our servicemen and against Afghans at the airport. Uh, it, is, it is almost impossible to gain visibility of, of, a, of, a, of a terrorist network without partners on the ground who are helping you uh, with human intelligence and be able to be able to map those networks. And so I, I think that th this can be a Band-Aid. You know, I think we could go after some of the most egregious jihadist terrorist leaders with this capability. But the idea that you can conduct effective counterterrorism against organizations like Al-Qaeda or the Haqqani network uh, is a pipe dream. The other thing to remember now is in our, I, I think, in our capitulation agreement to the Taliban, uh, we we uh, we recognize we, we're, we're recognizing their airspace uh, as well, and and I think are are reluctant to take actions that I think we should be taking now uh, against those who are terrorizing Afghan civilians or or maybe enforcing you know safe zones uh, for refugees uh, and those who are still resisting the Taliban. Um, but I, I think that those who talk about an over the horizon capability have only a limited knowledge of what it takes to conduct effective uh, counterterrorism operations. Thank you, General. And I totally agree with you. And uh, I see my time has expired. General's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Brad Sherman of California for five minutes. Thank you. I would disagree with the ranking member. Trump capitulated. He said we'd leave by May 1st of this year. He, would, he committed us to doing so. He would have done so. And he did so in negotiations where he excluded the Afghan argue, uh, um, uh, uh, government. Um, we, in World War II, won the kind of complete victory where we were able to rebuild our adversaries and our own image. And we came away, perhaps then, uh, with the idea that we should solve problems rather than manage problems. And Mr. Crocker, I think, correctly identified the fact that there are few total victories and the problems need to be managed. Um, the American people have a certain strategic impatience. Part of that may be our culture. Part of that is also our leaders don't level with us. No one told us we're going to go into Afghanistan and we're going to be there for 50 years uh, and we're going to remake Afghanistan and we'll incur 10 to 20 casualties a year for the latter 40 of those 50 years. They instead told us we were winning and that we were creating something. So I don't know whether America is incapable of doing what Rome did, maintain a defensive force then again along the Rhine River for hundreds of years. I don't know whether we're incapable of doing that because of our people or because of our leaders. Uh, what's being put forward here is there should have been a better plan for withdrawal. Well, uh, Secretary Blinken, in response to my questions, demonstrated there was no Trump plan for withdrawal. He said that this administration, that our current administration inherited a deadline, did not inherit a plan. Now, the generals are testifying as if they had a plan for an effective withdrawal. But as been pointed out in this hearing, it wasn't a withdrawal plan. It was a plan to stay there with at least 2,500 uh, uh, force, uh, of our forces for at least 25, well, and I won't say at least 25 years, but for, for perhaps 25 years. And when you leave 2,500, that means if they get in trouble, you have to be prepared to deploy uh, more. Um, historians will argue that perhaps we should have stayed in Afghanistan. Uh, the last 10 years we were there, the, uh, the costs in casualties were but 1% of what we had incurred earlier. But the American people uh, were never consulted about a long-term engagement. Uh, they were lied to about what was happening. And that brings me to believe it or not a question. Um, I can see 
the, the American people were being told, certainly after Osama bin Laden was killed, we're creating an Afghan government that's going to exclude terrorists from the Afghan territory, then we're going to withdraw. And that we're making progress toward that goal in 2003 and four and five and six and seven. Um, uh, Mr. McMaster, did the people running our policy believe that? Um, or in which case they were totally out of touch with what was going on in the country? Or did they uh, just figure that uh, they'd mislead the American people into believing that uh, for whatever reason? I think they were laboring under the flawed assumption that progress in war is linear. And they didn't acknowledge the authorship over the future that our enemies had. In those years that you mentioned, 2003, 4, 5, the, the Taliban was regenerating in Pakistan with the help of the ISI and with the help of Al-Qaeda. And so war is never linear, but we acted as if it was. Remember, I was, but that, uh, it, when President no, Obama said... Nobody the American people in 2017 and said, you know what? We're in worse position now than we were in 2007. We haven't made progress. Uh, the American people, we're being told every year, we're making progress toward this goal of a self-sufficient Afghanistan. Maybe not, it may, may not be New Jersey, but uh, it will exclude, uh, and we weren't in any better position in 2017 than we were in 2007. Why were the insiders lying to us, or did they not know? I, I think that you're right, that across multiple administrations, that our leadership, including the presidents, did not tell the American people what they deserve to know. What, what, why do they care? What is at stake in Afghanistan? Well, and what is a strategy look, look, that will deliver a favorable outcome? We're going to have to have strategic patience as a people. And in order to do that, we need a leadership that levels with us and says sometimes you have to stay on the front lines, hopefully with minimal casualties, for decades. And that may be... time has expired. Back. I now recognize Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Global Human Rights for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this important hearing. And to our distinguished witnesses, thank you for your insights and leadership. You know, uh, Ambassador Crocker, perhaps you could speak to the issue of how many Americans and Afghan allies were left behind and what is happening to them right now. Uh, is there any hope for a, a rescue? Uh, but what is happening day to day to those individuals? Uh, to uh, uh, General McMaster, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned how our allies' confidence is shaken. Our enemies are emboldened. The jihadist terrorists are claiming victory over a world superpower. And yet at a previous uh, committee hearing with uh, Secretary Blinken on the 13th of September, I asked him about the response of China. How are they internalizing what has happened here, especially as it relates to Taiwan. And we've seen a great uptick in provocations by uh, the Chinese military uh, against Taiwan. Uh, it may be the harbinger of some very, very bad things. We don't know yet. But, you know, uh, the world runs on incentives, positive and negative. Uh, and if the Chinese have taken the heart that somehow we're less engaged and that we left in such a, a despicable manner from Afghanistan, uh, does that, however unwittingly, make war more likely. I would remind, um, you know, my colleagues, I've been here since 1980. Uh, I've raised human rights issues in China my entire 41 years, chaired 73 hearings on human rights abuses. Uh, I'm on their hit list right now, uh, according to uh, their newspapers. The genocide that's going on, ongoing. Uh, you know, we, we, we said much. You, Mr. Chairman, and the ranking member, all of us spoke out boldly. But it has not deterred one iota uh, what Xi Jinping and his very cruel Chinese Communist Party is doing to the people there. Hong Kong obviously has lost seriously when it comes to democracy. Again, what is, um, what is Xi Jinping doing with regards to this? And finally, uh, I asked Secretary Blinken uh, the other day whether or not you know, the July 23rd phone call uh, when it was stated uh, that we need to show uh, a better a position, whether it be true or not, and it seems to me true or not, you know, whatever is true is true, not is, and it's not, uh, but we should not deceive or seek to deceive. His answer was he does not respond 
to leaked uh, transcripts of phone calls. And that phone call was reported by Reuters. Uh, perhaps you would want to speak to that as well, because that to me is very troubling. Uh, what can we count on if we're looking at perception rather than reality? Uh, uh, thank you, sir. I'll start with that thank question you. on peoples within Afghanistan that need to get out. Uh, my understanding is low hundreds uh, of American citizens. Uh, my more complete understanding is uh, thousands of uh, individuals eligible for special immigrant visas and their immediate families. The administration has also put on the table uh, hum uh, humanitarian parole, uh, which would cover thousands of uh, other Afghans. Now, how do you get them out? And here, I think the administration has done one thing that I, I do applaud. They have reorganized, as I understand it, their structures for dealing with the uh, uh, issue of uh, folks coming out of Afghanistan. So there is an element that is focused on resettlement in this country. There is an element that is focused on Afghans in third countries and on U.S. bases overseas. And a third element, um, those still within Afghanistan who need to get out. Uh, uh, Ambassador Beth Jones, my, uh, my former Foreign Service colleague, is heading that latter effort, getting people out who need to get out. And I cannot think of a more capable uh, and experienced individual, and also very creative, uh, to head up that effort. Uh, she is also very well known to uh, Secretary Armitage. Uh, so I am hoping with these clearer lines of distinction and better focus and uh, people who know how to do stuff uh, that we may now start to see uh, uh, something move more effectively on getting the people out who need to thank get you. out. Thank you. And General McMaster, if you could, thank you. Yeah, yeah just on, on the phone call, I think what's what's uh, important about it is the degree to which it, it reveals the reversal of morality uh, associated with our engagement with the Afghans. And, and, the, and the degree to which we we're actually, I think, partnering with the Taliban against the Afghan government. I know it sounds crazy, but I think that's what we were doing. You know, when we were urging Ashraf Ghani to do more for peace, the Afghan, the Taliban were accelerating their offensive at, at that very moment. We didn't, we didn't ask Haibatullah Akhundzada to do more, to do more for peace. And in connection with uh, the the fallout and and and, and uh, encouragement of the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army in Taiwan, the Chinese Communist Party has been really clear about it. If you see look at the the China Daily, the day after the fall of Kabul, the, the message to the Taiwanese people was: Do you think? Do you really think America has your back? And I would draw a direct line to these to these massive numbers of sorties that are threatening Taiwan now. Much like I think you can make the connection of the between the unenforced red line and Syria. 2013 and 2014, and Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea and invasion of Ukraine, as well as China's uh, as China's uh, building of violence and weaponizing of violence in the South China Sea. You know, deterrence is capability times will. And I think what makes this time very dangerous is many of our adversaries think our will is down to about zero. And so it is an extremely dangerous time that we're entering. And, and your committee, of course, has, I think, a very important role in waking us up to that danger. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Ted Deutsch of Florida, who's the chairman of the subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Counterterrorism, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meeks. Thanks for your leadership in making sure that, uh, that this committee has moved quickly to provide oversight on the Afghan withdrawal. Um, I thank the witnesses. It's a, a really distinguished panel. Uh, General McMaster, this is not what I was going to ask, but I, I have to follow up on your last comment, uh, drawing a straight line from our withdrawal from Afghanistan and the way it was handled to the actions today, this week by China uh, over Taiwan. Uh, what, what would you suggest the appropriate response at this point should be, since your suggestion, I, I gather, is that the sense of deterrence has been lost? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really to restore deterrence by, by convincing the Chinese Communist Party, the People's Liberation Army, that it cannot accomplish its objectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan through coercion or the direct use of military force. A lot of the actions that the Biden administration is, is undertaking are positive in that connection. The strength of the Quad, the AUKUS agreement, and I think especially the arms sales to Taiwan and the encouragement of the Taiwanese armed forces and Taiwan, Taiwanese leadership to make Taiwan indigestible 
to the People's Liberation Army. But of course, there are a range of actions that China can take below the threshold of what might elicit a concerted military response from the United States and, and our allies and partners in, in the region. And I think we're essentially in a race. We're in a race to, to restore deterrent capability across the Indo-Pacific and, and orient it on Taiwan already. I think the, the point of maximum danger is next year, uh, after the Beijing Olympics and after the Communist Party Congress uh, in 2022. Um, I appreciate it. Let me st stick with you, General McMaster. Uh, I, I believe that you said in your testimony that that in Afghanistan now, as a result of, of this withdrawal, that we're in a more precarious, a more dangerous position than we were on September 10th, 2001. Um, you, obviously, you, you've spoken about um, the, the fact that we cannot, should not work with the Taliban. You talked about the challenges to um, over the horizon, counterterrorism uh, as being ineffective. What, g given the picture that, that you painted, what is the right approach now to keep our homeland safe uh, in light of what you just walked through? Well, the, the right approach is a sustained effort against jihadist terrorists abroad and to doing that with a broad range of capabilities we can bring to bear to support our partners who actually bear the brunt of the fight against jihadist terrorists abroad. And that includes not only intelligence capabilities, but certainly military capabilities to advise armed forces and, and indigenous forces, you know, from the Sahel along with the French to Somalia uh, and then and then into Central Asia. If we do, if we are able to do that, uh, to, to have a base there and and and, and be effective there to, to, to the Philippines. Right. This is a model that works at a very low cost for us. It also includes, obviously, law enforcement cooperation and, and capabilities, as well as as financial actions uh, and, and, uh, and going after illicit financial flows. And of course, long term educational reform, as well as trying to isolate these groups from any source of ideological support. So it's really an intensification of our broader counterterrorist efforts. And and this, what I would say, maintaining the authorization of, uh, for the use of military force is very important. I think if you look at the, at the administration's actions against jihadist terrorists, they, they've let up, I think, in, in recent months. Maybe uh, you because of this idea that wars end when one side disengages. But I think it's worth pointing out really important for us to keep in mind, you know, these jihadists are waging an endless jihad against us. And when we leave, they don't look around and say, hey, the Americans are gone. I guess we'll just stop. Uh, thanks. And I appreciate that, General McMaster. Ambassador Liu, let me ask you a question. America is the first and only country to invoke NATO's Article 5 after, uh, as we did after 9-11. Um, there were all kinds of questions about coordination with our, our allies uh, during the drawdown. Can you speak to one, uh, your assessment of that coordination and consultation, and two, uh, steps that we can take now to improve and, and reaffirm our commitment, uh, our commitments going forward under NATO. All right, so I, I've spent the last two days here in Brussels at uh, our mission in NATO headquarters, and um, I've asked repeatedly NATO officials and allies about the press reports coming out of this summer that suggested from uh, allied capitals, that suggested that there was insufficient consultation leading up to the U.S. withdrawal. Uh, and frankly, the view from inside NATO headquarters is there was quite intense consultation leading up to the U.S. withdrawal, to include several ministerial meetings, both with uh, Tony Blinken and Lloyd Austin, uh, and, and in one occasion, an unusual joint foreign ministers, defense ministers meeting. And then there's, of course, the president's summit uh, in, um, in uh, June. The lack of consultation, most often mentioned here during my visit over the last two days, was not this summer, but the consultation leading uh, up to the lack of consultation leading up to the Khalilzad uh, Trump uh, deal in February of 2020. Uh, allies learned about the substance of that deal from the media, uh, and there was a period of time when the, administ the Trump administration refused to share the text of the agreement with the Taliban with NATO allies. That's that's the sorest point with regard to consultation. Thank you, Ambassador Lou. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Steve Shabbat of Ohio, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and Nonproliferation for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll begin with uh, you, Ambassador Crocker. Um, on August 31st, 2010, uh, President Obama declared, quote, 
the American combat mission in Iraq uh, has ended. Uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom is over. Um, at the time of the Iraq withdrawal, uh, the commanding general, I would note, uh, was, was General Austin. Uh, and exactly three years later, or excuse me, exactly 11 years later to the day, um, President uh, Biden declared last night in Kabul, the United States ended 20 years of war in Afghanistan, the longest war in American history. My fellow Americans, the war in Afghanistan is over, unquote. Is it really? And under the circumstances, are we likely to have to go back in as we did in Iraq? And uh, what are the security implications as a result of the chaotic evacuation uh, from Afghanistan? Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I have said this uh, for years now. Uh, uh, you don't end a war by withdrawing your forces. Uh, you simply seed the field to others who have more patience and more staying power. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it is simply false to claim that, you know, once we're gone, lights out, curtain down, war's over. No, it's not. And that's what we've seen in uh, uh, Iraq, of course, unfortunately, and that is now what we're seeing in uh, Afghanistan. So uh, you, you, you've got to keep you, you got to keep charging on these these sorts of things. Again, that strategic patience uh, issue. Uh, I, I would give you to the second part of your question, sir. I, I would uh, referring to the uh, uh, the force that came in, uh, Marines and um, airborne troopers, and I think did a fabulous job with a horrific situation. Um, you know, we uh, we lost folks there, uh, Marines and. Navy corpsman, and of course, an airborne trooper. Uh, it um, brings me to mind of what happened in Beirut in 1983. I was there. Uh, I was there when the embassy blew up in April, and I was there when the Marine barracks blew up in uh, October. Uh, and I would have to say that I hope uh, exceedingly that in the after-action reports uh, on how those uh, uh, Marines and uh, others were lost, that blame not be put on the shoulders of the MU commander or indeed of the airborne commander. Uh, I think they did a brilliant job under horrible conditions. One of the shameful things that I had to witness as an American uh, was the fact that in Beirut, after the, uh, the uh, barracks bombing, uh, responsibility was not placed any higher than on the MAU commander at the time. Um, uh, the loss of these folks, our Marines and uh, the others, uh, demands higher accountability than that. I just want to put that on the record. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my time's kind of limited. Uh, General McMaster, I'm going to uh, turn to you now if I can. How do you think Tehran and Beijing and Moscow are viewing the withdrawal, the chaotic withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan? Um, the current administration is insisting uh, that they're disappointed to see us leave. Um, is this an assessment that meshes with uh, reality, in, in your opinion? No, I, I think for, for China, for Beijing and Moscow, they're going to fill the void in Central Asia. I mean, uh, Ambassador Crocker would be better, much better qualified than me to, to, to talk about the geostrategic implications. But you can see what China's designs are in, in Pakistan with the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and the solidification of that uh, of that servile relationship, really, with the, with the Pakistanis. That's going that that's going to carry over, I think, into Central Asia with a, with an eye toward uh, Afghanistan, and is connected to really what they're trying to do on the Himalayan frontier and in, in Mongolia to to, uh, to 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 as part of the One Belt One Road uh, initiative to to gain a position of pre predominant preponderant power uh, you know, across the Eurasian la landmass. Frankly, now, Russia has been a source of funding and weapons to the to the Taliban. I, I think that you have much better information about that than I do. They've been hedging with them. So has China. I think they're in a rush to accommodate with the Taliban, you know, to gain a, to gain a position of strategic advantage. This has implications, obviously, for India as well. So the idea that disengaging from Afghanistan makes us more competitive with China, it makes no sense at, at all, because these other regions, including the greater Middle East as well, are arenas of competition with both Russia and China. And it's the lack of confidence that countries in those regions have in our staying power 
that leads them to a broad range of hedging activity. You see this play out in particular with Iran, which is the other uh, uh, element of your question. And Ambassador Crocker, again, would be much better to talk about this than I would. But I think the Iranians are emboldened by this. Their message to the to their militias uh, in, in Iraq uh, and, and in Syria are that, hey, the Americans are, are going to be on their way out here as well. That's been their message to the parliamentarians in Iraq too. Hey, get the Americans out. They're going to leave you hanging anyway. So I, I think that this has had a very negative effect by emboldening our adversaries. Thank you. General time has expired. I now recognize Representative Karen Bass of California, who's the chair of the subcommittee on Africa, global health, and global human rights for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank the ranking member. Uh, some of you in your opening statements made the observation that we simply did not read the situation in Afghanistan correctly. Ambassador Lute, you previously stated that the U.S. was devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan. For any of our witnesses, do you agree with this assessment? And if so, what do you think contributed to us not reading it right then and now? And how can we ensure that the U.S. government is able to see things from the perspective of others rather than simply our own in moving forward? So uh, maybe I could start with uh, Ambassador Luke, and then we'd like to ask the other witnesses the same questions. Sure. What I meant by that quote is that we had an insufficient understanding of the details of the facts uh, surrounding our intervention in Afghanistan. Now, it's, it's also understandable. I mean, if we go back to the weeks just after 9-11, there was a rush and, and a, a prudent rush to strike the Taliban safe haven, to dislocate, bring uh, al-Qaeda, bring them to justice and so forth, because we weren't sure that 9-11 was a one-off event. We right. thought there were potentially follow-on waves. So the initial intervention made a lot of sense. The comment that you quote, and my comment that you quote, I had to do with the shift from that operation, focused narrowly on Al-Qaeda, and then assuming a more ambitious objective of building a state in Afghanistan. And here I think we had insufficient understanding uh, on the demographics, on the geography, on the region, um, on the political culture in Afghanistan, and on the history of Afghanistan. So we created lofty goals for ourselves without sufficient background. So, I mean, we have a history of trying to rebuild nations and create new states. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know of what your overall opinion of that is, not just in Afghanistan, but elsewhere. I mean, we did the same thing in Iraq, too. Well, it, it does play out in, uh, in other scenarios over the last... 50 years, uh, where we've gone into places, not really understood what, what was going on, didn't have sufficient understanding of the texture of the problem, uh, and that has come back to bite us. Can you think of anywhere where we've been successful in the last 50 years in terms of building a new country? Yeah, you have to give me a few minutes. Maybe you want to defer to someone else first. <laughs> Okay, maybe some of the other witnesses can respond to that. Or yeah, I think there are lots of examples, right? And there are examples of where we still are. Ask Ambassador Crocker to maybe to, to jump here as well. You know, we're still in Bosnia, we're still in Kosovo. I think the I think the the, the people in the, in those regions prefer you know, uh, much uh, the situation they're in now uh, rather than going through what they what they've gone through. Uh, you have you, we had an intervention in Panama that I think was pretty successful. We've had a long term support for Colombia. Uh, which everyone had predicted would be an, an utterly failed state in 1999. Still not a pretty place in, in, in many ways. How about South Korea, though? You know, from 1953, it looked pretty bleak, and South Korea wasn't on the path to really to really being successful until economic reforms in the 70s and uh, and, and then governance reforms in the 80s, right? There are no you know short-term solutions to long-term problems. And Representative Bass, what I think happened in, in, in Afghanistan – is I think we understood it well enough. I mean, how about just asking some enough Afghans and and, and figuring it out, right? Uh, I think the, the problem was our policies and strategies were based on fantasy in Washington instead of reality on the ground. Think about what our leaders told us, even just recently. They keep telling us, well, you know, the you know, the Haqqani network is separate from the Taliban, is separate from al-Qaeda. I mean, really? That's utterly delusional, right? That the Taliban is going to share power, a more benign form of Sharia. You know, it's it's really actually, it would be laughable if it wasn't so, if it wasn't so devastating in terms of the consequences. Let me, let me just ask you, uh, after our 20 year experience in Afghanistan, do you think there's any development or security component of what we tried to build that is sustainable or is it all 
gone. Yeah, a lot of it was sustainable if we had sustained our commitment there and allowed the Afghans to continue to bear the brunt of the fight of of maintaining and preserving those freedoms, right? And I think now. you can see what we've accomplished based on us watching the Taliban take it away from the right. Afghan people. So, so and, now that they did, do you th is there anything left? I guess that's my question. I, I think in the hearts of, of Afghans, I, I think that I think that when we keep saying, hey, let's engage the Taliban on the future of Afghanistan, how about engaging the over 90% of Afghans who don't want to live under Taliban rule you know, and, and giving them a voice? I think that's something your committee uh, can, can maybe do in terms of reorientation as well. Thank you, thank you. And, uh, Ms. Bass, could I add one thing, please? Yes, please. I want to, don't want to be the skunk at the picnic, but uh, we could not prevail in Afghanistan. It's not because our soldiers aren't the best. They are. But it's because over time, from 2005 and 2006, when General Eikenberry was our chief trainer, Ron Newman was our ambassador, already cables were coming in saying, we're not losing yet, but we're going to be soon. Things were changing. The uh, Taliban were digging up their weapons. And yet we never changed really what we were doing. It reminds me of the story of a, a group of blind men who are asked to describe an elephant. And it kind of depends where they don't see elephant, how they describe it. So some of our folks would describe women's issues and girls that are going to school and health. And that's fantastic. And great strides were made. But how about the one stride that was never made and we could not prevail without it, and that is this corruption. Because at the end of the day, I personally, and when said it publicly, was not surprised at the speed with which um, uh, things fell because Afghan soldiers just felt that their corrupt government was not worth the sacrifice mm. of their lives. I saw it before in Vietnam, the exact same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe my time is up. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you uh, holding the hearing for us. And I got to say, you know, um, the American people want accountability, and especially with the uh, the, the circumstance with this Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel, and I'm not going to defend his actions as a guy who has... Uh, who, who has been privileged to wear the uniform for a very, very long time. However, the irony that that he's being punished and the people at the top of this horrific, just astounding failure on behalf of the American people. And maybe, look, maybe the administration wanted it to work out this way. I think there's a lot of conjecture that points in that direction, but the American people sure didn't want it this way. And, and with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, none of the people on the panel today, although all distinguished, bear any responsibility for what just happened. And even to my good friend from Sherman Oaks, I must disagree, saying that, uh, that uh, the Trump administration left no plan. Uh, they didn't like the plan. The Biden administration didn't like the plan. I get that. But they changed every other dang thing that the Trump administration sought to do, including Nord Stream. Uh, the, the Paris climate of Gordon, you, you can go down the list with the Mexico City policy, but somehow they couldn't find it in their heart to, 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 to get us out of Afghanistan in a responsible and respectful and life-saving way. And, and, and so I just disagree with that. But with the, with the guests that we have present, I want to turn to General McMaster. Um, the, the, uh, the, made, the, the um, designation of major non-NATO ally. Um, can you shed any light on to why you think this administration has refused to at least tell the Congress of its intent to terminate that for Afghanistan? And I say that in the context of American tax dollars have been going there for a long time. Our lives and treasure have just been going there. And in many people's minds now, it's wasted. And, and they feel like they don't want to continue to pay uh the Afghanistan, the corrupt government of Afghanistan, and the terrorist super state that we have created. So you mean Pakistan? Make, think you mean, you mean Pakistan? No, I mean or Afghanistan, and then I'm going to get to Pakistan. So what, you can go ahead and handle both of them if you want to, sir. Well, I, I think it's delusional to think that any of the any of the money that would go to the Taliban or through the Taliban for humanitarian purposes would immediately be go, go be wasted or used for the Taliban to solidify their power. 
and to become an even greater threat. So we're in a situation where we're facing a really extraordinary dilemma that it's going to be tough for us to mitigate the humanitarian crisis without without empowering the, the Taliban. Uh, I don't think we should give any assistance to Pakistan at all. I think Pakistan has had it both ways for way too long. I think our uh, obviously we have two great experts here, so I'll just stop there. But I think Pakistan should... Uh, should be confronted uh, with its behavior over the years that it, that has actually resulted, I think, in large measure in this outcome. Uh, I think we ought to hold Imran Khan responsible for his comments when Kabul fell, when he said the Afghan people have been unshackled. Why should we send a dime uh, to Pakistan under any conditions? I, I think that they should you know, be confronted with international isolation because of their support for jihadist terrorists who are threats to all humanity, including, you know, including the Haqqani Network. Uh, including the Taliban and including groups like Lashkari Taiba. So I agree with you. Help make some sense of this to me. Why is the Biden administration uh, not uh, moving forward with uh, removing, especially Pakistan's uh, status as a major non-NATO ally? What, what 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 would be the rationale? What would be the purpose? Yeah, I I think that they I think they should uh, I think they should move forward with it. Maybe they're assessing it, but I think that they I think this is a good idea. This also I know that's a tough in, question for you I to would, answer. I, w- I would say the be- the only time I think we have ever laid out a very clear and realistic assessment of South Asia and prioritized the strategy was President Trump's speech in August of 2017. Now he abandoned it and he doubled down on the flaws of the Obama administration. I don't know how that happened, but I think if you go back to that August 2017 speech. That was the proper approach to Pakistan as well, which called for a suspension of all assistance to Pakistan until Pakistan fundamentally changed its behavior. So let me ask you one follow up. uh, And again, I know you can't answer for the Biden administration, but uh, Secretary Blinken accepted uh, accepted a speaking fee from Imran Khan. And now, you know, obviously the prime minister of Pakistan who's praised the Taliban every single day now. Uh, should we be concerned about that? Should we care about that? Is that an issue or a non-issue? Does that does that point to a relationship issue that we should have some concern about? I, I don't know anything about it, but I can't I can't imagine him compromising our interest for you know for a speaking fee, and I hope that wouldn't be the case. And uh, you know, but I, on Pakistan, I think the person to ask the next question is 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 Ambassador Crocker because he spent a heck of a lot more time there than I did, or Dick Armitage. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. I yield the balance. Gentleman yields back uh, the balance of his time. Uh, I now recognize um, Representative Bill Keating of Massachusetts, who's the chairman of the Subcommittee on Europe, Energy, and Environment and Cyber for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a perfect segue uh, to my questioning that I wanted. Uh, I just want to remind the gentleman that just spoke that uh, Secretary Blinken was in front of this committee, and I questioned him about Uh, our relationship uh, now with Pakistan. And and he did say uh, clearly that we have to reassess that relationship, just to remind the gentleman that just spoke uh, uh, before me. Uh, But Pakistan remains a problem, and we do indeed, I believe, have to reassess it. Uh, Its longstanding uh, activities, by many accounts, have been negative. I think that's uh, putting it mildly. For for decades, though, for decades, uh, whether you go back to uh, 96, when the Taliban took control, Pakistan was one of the first to recognize them. When you go through the, t- the change in 2001 in Afghanistan, uh, and then the reconstruction of the Taliban starting around 2005, uh, they were there giving assistance by all accounts, and I believe those accounts are accurate. And indeed, uh, right up into this current uh, change uh, in the government, Pakistan, there were many people that suggest they were, their intelligence uh, was embedded with them. And clearly, uh, their relationship with the Haqqani network uh, is one that uh, is of great concern. Uh, you can go back to the branding of the name Taliban. Pakistan was involved in that brand testing and, and the actual name. Uh, I could go on and on, but I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Armitage uh, and then Mr. Crocker, we definitely have to reassess our position with Pakistan. Uh, that may indeed uh, affect our relations with India in that respect. But but can you comment on that? I, I think they've been duplicitous, not just recently, not just in the few months of this administration, but for decades uh, in, in this, uh, with both, with many administrations, Republican and Democratic alike. So please, uh, I'd like your comments on the reassessment of Pakistan. 
Mr. Keating, I uh, don't think we have time before Pakistan is <laughs> going to be having their own problem. Uh, right now, as one of my colleagues said earlier, there's some high-fiving going on. The Taliban have realized their strategic depth desires again by having Afghanistan on their side. But it's not as if the Pakistani Taliban wish their government particularly well. And I think it'll evidence itself in Kashmir. And when Kashmir blows up, which I think it very well might, then you've got India, China, <coughs> excuse me, and Pakistan all involved in this. So I was not being facetious. I don't think we have enough time to do a proper reassessment. Uh, well, if I so, could, I, I recall myself, if I may, and, just reclaiming and my and time. They're and they've been lying to us. Just for a distinction here, uh, Pakistan always points to their relationship with Pakistan tel Taliban, but they don't talk about the Haqqani network either. Uh, they, they, they say, oh, we're worried about, you know, extremists here. But they've turned to actually been cooperative, I know, from my, my own reflections, with the uh, Haqqani network. So, uh, Ambassador Crocker, would you like to chime in, too, on, on, this, on this reassessment? Certainly, I would agree with the points that uh, my colleagues uh, just made. Uh, uh, Pakistan worked against us in some very fundamental aspects with their uh, support for the Taliban. Earlier, I, I tried to present their narrative as to why, uh, that we were going to walk out and they did not want to be left with the Taliban as a mortal enemy. Well, they may get that anyway. And as satisfying as it would be to a lot of us, myself included, uh, to do something to um, punish Pakistan for this, I don't think we have the luxury. Uh, they are already worried over the repercussions inside their own country of the Taliban's so-called victory in uh, in Afghanistan. Now we can say, yep, well, they deserve whatever they get, but but again, uh, you know, unless, as uh, Secretary Armitage said, uh, you know, a a blow up in Kashmir uh, is going to bring us bring a regional war. So I, I think uh, reassessment is always good, but let's reassess with a clear eye on the dangers now that the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan has created throughout the region. We do not need a completely destabilized Pakistani state with nuclear weapons. All right. I know I cut you off for 19 seconds, Mr. Armitage, if you just had a thought quickly. I guess... I guess not. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've got 10 seconds left, so I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I now recognize Representative Darrell Issa of California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Secretary Armitage, uh, you and I have some, some history, uh, but your history is a little closer to a lot of examples that I want to use today. In the opening statement that you submitted for the record, uh, you said, but just as Saigon, the corrupt government of Kabul, was not worth the sacrifice of Afghan soldiers. The Afghan people and the Taliban saw this. We did not. Uh, you stand by, I'm sure, that statement that uh, you put into the... Uh, Congressman, uh, we do have history. On Put history together. Government but I know... I not only stand by that statement, I wish I'd have made it stronger. Well, and so I'm going to uh, give you some rhetoricals because I, I think I think it's a good statement and I think it's going to stand. But I also think it's going to have to be nuanced uh, during the time, for example, when we were uh, uh, finally taking our bases out of the Philippines. You were close to that. Uh, the Philippine government could be only considered to be cor corrupt by any standards. Right. Uh, the Philippine Jeremy government Jeremy. agreed. Yes, sir. Uh, the Filipino government agreed with us and negotiated a base agreement with us. The Senate in the Philippines voted it down. Right. But uh, basically, during the decades that we were in the Philippines, one would not consider them a sterling democracy. And, uh, and rather than having your answer just one, uh, would, you, would you say that uh, during the years of martial law, uh, which was more than two decades of Shanghai Shek era ruin, uh, you know, rule was Taiwan a model democracy? Uh, was South Korea from the start a model democracy? Uh, and we could go on. We certainly could look at the Shah of Iran, 
Uh, we could look at both successes and failures, but let's just, you know, in, including Saigon. Uh, but the question is, if that is the case, and if that model of is a government worthwhile, then are we in fact basing our support for governments on whether they're, they're worthy or whether our strategic uh, interest in the long run against evils such as Iran, such as China, and quite candidly, the continued evil of Russia are worth fighting. And I take you back to our early careers uh, when we were fighting the Cold War and we were standing up against uh, the Soviet Union and trying to give an opportunity for dozens of countries behind the Iron Curtain to become free, something that became a reality during our lifetime, uh, are, are, is our model to, to base on the goal of freedom and opportunity uh, in spite of failed governments and failed leaders, or are we going to base all of this based on whether or not a people should be free because their leaders are sufficient to our standard? Uh, Congressman, it's the latter. We make cold calculations of our national security. Uh, and sometimes we like the leaders and sometimes we don't. For instance, in the Philippines, President Marcos was taking us down a bad path. You remember the New People's Army was gaining in strength and we were actually quite afraid we'd lose our strategic position in the Philippines. So we flipped in a cold calculation of our national security. So I'm not saying we have to like the leaders. I'm not saying we have to admire the leaders, but we've got to understand their weak points. And we were not doing anything, in my view, to overcome the weak points of our uh, government, the government of the people in Afghanistan. Uh, and Secretary, I would say from uh, uh, from the beginning with, uh, with the Afghan leadership, uh, that was true, including Cars. Die. But in the minute that I have remaining for each of the witnesses, if Secretary Armitage is, uh, is to be understood correctly, that our interest is in a freer, more secure world for ourselves and one in which human beings have a better opportunity, many of whom have very defective governments, uh, governments by kings, by uh, dictators of all sort today. If that's our goal, then don't we have to, in fact, look at remaining with the military and other forces if it, if it means that in the long run we're moving toward a freer world and those people having that opportunity? And didn't we fail to do that for the people, the 37 million people of Afghanistan? I, I think we very definitely uh, uh, failed in that uh, endeavor, and it is doubly ironic and, and quite sad, at least <clears throat> to me, uh, that in Afghanistan, we had one of those rare intersections of our, our values of uh, freedom for all peoples and our national security interests. You have a generation of Afghans now who grew up in a free media environment, who uh, uh, had an open curriculum in school. That was a huge investment toward a more stable Afghanistan in the long run uh, that would enhance our values, much as you have said about the world at large. Uh, and we walked away from it. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time is expired. Rhode Island for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for calling this hearing. Uh, it's an opportunity, obviously, to discuss the war in Afghanistan, but also to make it clear that we remain engaged with our stakeholders on the ground in Afghanistan so that we can continue to advocate for women and girls. LGBTQI plus Afghans, other religious minorities, and, and other vulnerable populations. My hope is that uh, the shadow of America's longest war will serve as an opportunity to scrutinize how America waged war in Afghanistan and how, if it must, it should wage war in the future. And I think it's also an opportunity for Congress to take stock of our responsibility in terms of oversight for military action. And so, um, Secretary Armitage, I'd like to begin with you. You referenced uh, the linkage between the deeply corrupt nature of the national government of Afghanistan and the inability of the Afghan army to repel the Taliban advance. What lessons are there for us to learn and how we responded to the open secret that Afghanistan's government was mired in corruption? And how could the U.S. military and the Congress of the United States have addressed this issue more proactively and more effectively? Thank you. 
Congressman. I think in a way uh, you've answered part of the question. Uh, we could have used, I think, usefully a lot more congressional oversight. And I think we certainly could have used uh, a real sharpened point on our aims. Uh, as a former boss of mine wrote in a book called All Wars Must End, it's easy to get into wars, it's hard to get out. Uh, you know, we if the definition of insanity, as many say, is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, then we were doing some insanity. We can train the Afghan army again. We've done it many times before. We can equip them again. But just by the way, they didn't need much help in shooting weapons uh, at all. But what we couldn't do, I referenced in my statement, is if put in their guts the willingness to die for that government. Uh, I frankly understand that. Uh, some of them fought terrifically hard, and some didn't. Uh, but I think the big lesson is, it's, it's an overall one. Paul Eikenberry, Lieutenant General Eikenberry, taught me this in Afghanistan, and that is, uh, we in our society are kind of blind to ethnicity. Uh, well, in Afghanistan, if you have a Tajik commander of a Pashtun unit, that's bad you do. Yeah. And if you have a Hazar commander of a Tajik unit, ooh, not good. Got and it. we were doing this willy-nilly. So I think there are a ton of questions. And as Lieutenant General Lute said, the real question is, will we all together learn the lessons? Thank you. Ambassador Crocker, I think one of the other issues that's particularly important to uh, members of Congress is that we get information, obviously, from the military, from the intelligence community, and we make judgments based on the information presented. And I'm wondering how we can better promote information exchanges between the national security community, the State Department, and Congress so that the information that's given to Congress is genuine, up-to-date, and authentic, uh, even if that information provokes consternation among some members. And are there some existing models that would help ensure that the information presented to Congress regarding conflicts is not biased in its articulation. I feel like every time I was in Afghanistan, I was always given this, this description of we're making great progress, things are really good, it's just a little more time, a little more true presence, more resources, and I just wonder how do we improve the exchange of information so we're making judgments and conducting oversight based on accurate, reliable information. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a very interesting proposition. It would require, I think, a complete overhaul of uh, uh, the way administrations think of Congress and uh, think of their, uh, their agendas and, and how they are promoted. Um, clearly, when a, uh, a serving member of an administration is called to testify, uh, she or he uh, is representing that administration. It's not, uh, I think, realistic to expect that uh, you are going to get uh, purely uh, objective testimony from someone who is uh, currently inside an administration. I do think as well, though, uh, that uh, a more pointed and sustained conversation between uh, Congress and the administration, any administration, toward that end would be helpful. I, uh, Thank you. I, I just want to know, uh, Ambassador Lou, I want to be sure I understood you. Did you say that the prior administration, the Trump administration, did not consult with our allies when President Trump negotiated the surrender to the Taliban and that they learned about it by reading it in the newspaper? And if that's correct, and that's a quite different than the Biden administration had deep consultation, would you describe what the impact of that sort of conduct is on the relationship with our allies? Well, yeah, what I uh, encountered here at NATO is a lasting, the lasting effect of the February 2020 experience when allies first learned of the text of the agreement, the Doha agreement with the Taliban by way of a, uh, a media report. And when beyond that, when they then queried the administration to get the text to include the supporting annexes, uh, they were for some time, some time stonewalled and refused access to those agreements. And of course, the, the quick retort is, wait a second, let me get this straight, said reliable allies. We've been there for, with you for 20 years, and the Taliban can see this agreement, but we can't. Uh, and that, that has a lasting, that, that, that's going to have a lasting stain in our relationship here. Now, it's, it's repairable, but it's going to take a lot of effort. Thank you, Ambassador. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Has expired. 
I now recognize, the gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Adam Kinzinger of Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to everybody for being here. This is important. We, we're going to face this again someday. Uh, if history's any guide, and it always is. Yeah, yeah I'm going to say something that, uh, for some reason, uh, those of us in politics can't understand, but the average American does, which is uh, Joe Biden bungled the execution of this pullout, and Donald Trump set this up to fail. You cannot negotiate with an in-state of leaving and tweet about it daily and expect to get any kind of a good deal. Uh, I want to be clear about that. And, you know, the, the other thing we hear a lot about, you know, the surrender of the Afghan military, and I agree, I wish they'd have fought harder. I think it's important to keep in mind, though, every military relies on air power and logistics, and that's what we built in the Afghan military. I don't think there's a lot of forces in this world that would be able to withstand an assault from the Taliban without logistics and without air support and with allies abandoning them. Um, I think you would see uh, military units break down. Um, I think it's clear that we surrendered unnecessarily in this fight. You know, as President Reagan said, uh, we can have peace, we can have it tomorrow, surrender. The problem is in a few days, you may not have that peace anymore. Uh, General McMaster, I, I read your book, and uh, it's really good, by the way, I recommend it, but I, I want to ask you a couple of things. So first off, you discuss the area of corruption, and I want to ask you about that corruption in, yes, the Taliban, but particularly the former Afghan government, because that's where a lot of our endless war you know, friends uh, would come down and say it's too corrupt, not worth it. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the role of corruption, how we could have done it better? Hey, I thank you for this opportunity. You know, I, I commanded a counter-corruption and organized crime task force in Afghanistan for two years. Once we realized it was a, it was a fatal threat to the state, uh, it was maybe too little too late. And of course, many of the recommendations didn't make it past uh, Washington, D.C., because we continued to try to turn a blind eye to it. But I'll tell you, I think what is very uh, poorly understood is, the, is, is where that corruption came from. It came from our short-term approach to the long, to what was necessarily a long-term effort in Afghanistan. And we kept telling the Afghans, hey, we're leaving. Hey, we're leaving. Okay, now we're really leaving. And so Afghans, like, they looked over their shoulder. Who's got our back? Nobody. So what's going to happen? Probably a return of the Civil War from 92 to 96. So what do we do about that? We need to build up our war chest and our power base in advance of a post-United States, post-international community at Afghanistan. And this incentivized the Mujahideen era militias, who we empowered, remember, as the main defeat mechanism for the Taliban in 2001 with our tremendous intelligence professionals and special forces and air power, to then morph into criminalized patronage networks who, who captured the, the nascent state institutions and functions that were being rebuilt in the wake of the, uh, of the Taliban destruction of those institutions. And what those organizations did is they stole from the state and weaken the state to build up those power bases. Hamid Karzai, having looked over his back, over his shoulder, who's got my back? Nobody. He began to cut deals with them. And so what he did is he gave these groups license to steal in exchange for their political fealty. So this is why these networks were actually hollowing out and, and weakening the state institutions we were trying to build. And we didn't take enough time, we did on tick time, or task force did, to understand the political drivers of this, and then to address it. And the fundamental way to address it was with really a long-term commitment and backing the reforms that were necessary. Now these, again, Afghanistan didn't need to be Denmark. Afghanistan just needed to be Afghanistan with a, with a, with a political settlement and a, and a, and a political uh, structure in place that was anti-jihadist terrorists. And that's what we had. And the reason why Afghan forces uh, collapsed, I, I go into more detail on this in, in, my, in my statement for the record, is we delivered psychological blow after psychological blow to them from the capitulation agreement in 2020, which you, which you mentioned, to you know, not allowing the Afghans to be part of that negotiation, to then forcing the Afghan government to release 5,000 of the most heinous people on earth who went immediately back to terrorizing uh, the Afghan people, and then announcing our withdrawal announcing the date of the withdrawal, giving them the, the, the troop limits to the Taliban. What, that's, that's capitulation is, is what that is. And then what, what did the Taliban do with that? They went around to the Afghan units and they said, hey, here's, this, this, here's how this is going to go. With the backing of the Pakistani ISI, intertwined with the Haqqani network and, and Al-Qaeda, what they did is they told those commanders, hey, listen, you accommodate with us when we give you the signal or we kill your family. 
How does that sound? And so that, that's why the Afghan forces uh, collapsed, in addition to what you mentioned, which is the withdrawal of our intelligence support, the withdrawal of our air power, which was the Afghan forces differential advantage. The Taliban's differential advantage was the backing by the by the ISI and other, other groups. But it was their it was their unscrupulousness and they're willing to terrorize. They didn't give up their 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 their, their differential advantage. And so I, I don't think it's a mystery at all. Uh, why why they uh, they collapsed and I think it is it it is uh, it, it is um, it should be unacceptable I think uh, to 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 disparage uh, the Afghans who did fight and si over sixty thousand of them uh, made the ultimate sacrifice to preserve the freedoms we're now seeing it you know, was taken away uh, from the Afghan people. Thank you, sir. I have nothing to add, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. I'll come back. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Ami Barrow of California, who's the chair of the subcommittee on Asia. Pacific, Central Asia, and non-proliferation for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you know, it's surprising to me. I actually agree with knowing that each of the witnesses has slightly different perspectives. I think all of you present the, the real complexity of Afghanistan and you know, the, the complexity of building a successful government there and, and, and the like. Given um, that Afghanistan falls into my jurisdiction of my subcommittee, I'd like to focus my time on the current situation that we have and how we ought to think about approaching this. And you know, we've, maybe I'll start with Ambassador Crocker. I've had direct conversations with the Pakistanis um, saying that while our relationship is at an all time low, this is a point in time where they have to step up. You know, certainly you know, it doesn't look like the, the government that's forming in Afghanistan is going in the direction that, that we'd like in terms of a coalition. But it's in Pakistan's interest not to have a, a failed state, a civil war, um, a base of operations where these terrorist networks can, can operate within Pakistan. And that it does scare the hell out of me that you know, Pakistan's a nuclear armed country that, you know, I think you will see. Um, I don't trust Pakistan. They haven't been good faith actors. But from your assessment, how should we work with you know Pakistan? You know, we had conversations with the Uzbeks who, you know, I think have um, been much more helpful to us as we try to get folks out of country. You know, you're seeing tensions on the um, Tajikistan border with with Afghanistan, and you know, how do we avoid a, a full civil war? Well, the short answer, sir, is that. Um, uh, we probably cannot avert um, a wholesale civil war. But what we do need to do, uh, I think, is uh, talk to the region, uh, uh, starting with Pakistan. That is the greatest danger. Uh, they face these internal threats, which, of course, are largely of their own making. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that uh, their stability, I think, post-Taliban takeover in Afghanistan uh, is under greater threat than it um, has ever been. So starting a conversation with them on um, let, let's analyze the threat, what's real, what's not, and then let's talk about how it can be mitigated. Expand that to the, uh, the region, uh, as you noted, Uzbekistan, <clears throat> uh, uh, Tajikistan, the, all of the stands uh, north of Afghanistan need to be part of this conversation. Uh, and I think in a uh, ironic kind of way, the uh, American withdrawal and the uh, chaos that surrounded it uh, has gotten everybody's attention that, uh, uh oh, this may not be exactly the outcome we want. Uh, what are we going to do about it? So seeing if we can uh, broker a set of conversations to, to act like a leader, uh, going back to the statements I and my colleagues have tried to make today, uh, uh, to see how collectively we can deal with the, the very new, very dangerous threat inside of, um, inside of Afghanistan. And, you know, maybe just um, continuing on, on this, and I'd open it up to the other witnesses. While we see the worst case scenario with the, um, the, the Taliban administration, the folks that are being put in place, and maybe this is the Taliban of the 1990s, Afghanistan's not the Afghanistan of the 1990s. I would certainly hope that 20 years of investment education uh, has empowered and changed the people of Afghanistan. What can, you know, again, I would hope that people just don't roll over, even given the brutality of the Taliban. 
what can we do to support the people of Afghanistan in trying to come up with a better outcome? Well, Congressman, I'd like to weigh in on that. I think the thing we're going to see in the next year, so the next, the most immediate challenge here will be the humanitarian crisis. Uh, which may have happened with or without the Taliban taking power. But the combination of uh, financial resources, lack of financial resources, uh, a largely unvaccinated uh, population against COVID, um, so health concerns. There's a major drought that's been playing out over several years, so food security is at an all-time low, coupled with the fact that we now have a Taliban government, even this transition government, that doesn't know how to govern. I mean, they know how to fight, and, and they've proven effective at that. But they're not a government. Um, so you have large scale incompetence uh, or just lack of experience uh, across this transition government. That's a recipe for a humanitarian disaster. So one thing I think we have to do, uh, keep in mind the point made earlier in the, in the hearing that we don't want to empower the Taliban in the process. But the humanitarian disaster, if it plays out as forecasted, will also be a continuing uh, uh, reflection on us and how we left Afghanistan. So this story is not over, and it will be played out, I think, in coming months, especially as we go into the, uh, into the winter months, uh, the harsh condi conditions of winter. Um, it'll be played out, and it'll land on our doorstep. Great, thank you. And I see my time's expired. Gentleman's time, gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Ann Wagner of Missouri, who is the vice ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This committee has a duty to provide oversight of the administration's disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I certainly appreciate your attention to this critical issue. Over the course of 20 long, difficult years in Afghanistan, U.S. service members restored the safety of the American homeland even as they won remarkable progress in respect for human rights, prosperity, and women's equality abroad. The Biden administration's ill-advised, uh, disorganized, and dishonorable, frankly, flight from Afghanistan threatens to wipe away our hard-fought progress. It has made America less safe, and it has created a human tragedy that we've all been speaking about of unimaginable proportions in Afghanistan. In the harrowing days following the 9-11 attacks, President Bush declared war on terrorism. And on August 31st, 2021, not long after a terrorist attack on the airport in Kabul robbed us of 13 more young service members, President Biden declared the war over. But President Biden's unilateral announcement ignores the intentions of our adversaries. As long as there are terrorists bent on attacking the United States, its people, and its interests, the war on terrorism must continue. And the president's actions have made it much more difficult for the United States to effectively prosecute that war. General McMaster, uh, how will the administration's failure to secure basing, intelligence, and strike capability agreements with third countries bordering Afghanistan affect our counterterrorism posture, and how can we best make up for lost time, sir? Representative Weiner, th thank, thank you. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a theoretical or an academic case, right? When terrorists gain control of havens and support bases, they become orders of magnitude more dangerous, right? We know this from September 11th, the most devastating terrorist attack in, in history, and we know it from the rise of ISIS. After we declared the war in Iraq over, disengaged from, from Iraq, Diplomatically, I would say, as well as as, as well as politically, and allowed uh, the, the the policies of the the Iraqi administration to set conditions for the rise of Al Qaeda in Iraq 2.0, which became ISIS, which gained control of territory the size of Britain, became the most destructive terrorist organization in history, conducting 195 attacks internationally. Remember the Brussels airport and Paris mm -hmm. and Marseille and mm -hmm. the, the ISIS-inspired attack in, in San Bernardino. 
So what, what we have to do is redouble our efforts against these organizations uh, by integrating all elements of our power and the efforts of like-minded partners to isolate terrorist organizations from sources of strength and support and to attack their vulnerabilities, not just militarily, but financially and ideologically. And, and but, I, I, I get a sense that we're disengaging. We think we think yeah, it's over. And, 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 and General, my, my concern is that we have no one in the region, we've discussed Pakistan not being a reliable U.S. partner a little bit here today. Um, you know, we need to develop those relationships. And let me ask you again, General McMaster, what should we expect to see from the, for instance, the People's Republic of China in its approach to Pakistan moving forward post-U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan? How will the PRC and Pakistan seek to advance their joint interests given the situation on the ground in Afghanistan? And what does that mean for the U.S. and our partners, especially, let's say, India? Well, I, I think it's an extremely dangerous situation in South Asia broadly. Again, this is a, a, a question that Ambassador Crocker could take on really much more ably than I can. But I'll just, I'll just say quickly that, that I do think that it is in China's interest, right, that the Pakistani government and army go after these jihadist groups less selectively. It's also in the interest, obviously, of, of security and stability across South Asia. One of the greatest dangers, I think, would be India suffering this kind of, of cycle of sectarian violence uh, that that you see across the greater Middle East, and that could be incited by some of these groups like, like uh, you know, like like Al Qaeda uh, and and Lashkar Taiba. So, my, so I, my time my, my time is, is very short. Ambassador Crocker, uh, your thoughts? I I, I would agree. Uh, the Chinese have created their own vulnerability with their repression of their Muslim population population, the Uyghurs in the West. Uh, so they have got a strong incentive, I think, to work. Uh, to use some pressure that they have on Pakistan uh, to bring about a better result than we've seen so far. Thank uh, you. Time time and I yield back. I now recognize Representative Dina Titus of Nevada for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the panelists. So many of the questions I wondered about have already been asked and answered, and I appreciate that. One other thing that I would like to hear a little bit about from uh, Secretary Armitage. In your uh, written statement, you mentioned there are several periods during this time of intervention in Afghanistan that could have been potential points of departure. Uh, the first was after the Bonn uh, Agreement. And you said, I quote you, you said, there was little opposition to President Karzai and little animus towards the United States. Afghanistan was at peace. Well, I would ask you and maybe the other panelists, was there ever an exit strategy drawn up or planned when we got into Afghanistan? And second, why didn't we consider leaving after the bond agreement or some of these other points that you mentioned? If I told you anything but no, there was no real exit strategy, I'd be telling you a falsehood. Uh, we were in on automatic pilot, I think, shortly after we had the success of the Bonn Agreement. Uh, and the description that you just read out, Congresswoman, is absolutely correct. Relative peace, relatively little animus towards us, uh, and a willingness to at least entertain uh, what looked like it was going to be a Karzai government. And then Tora Bora, where we chased Osama bin Laden and some of his uh, henchmen into the snows and the mountains alongside Pakistan, uh, followed shortly after the Bonn Agreement would have been a perfect time, having defeated in a very real way the Taliban, to pull out. And then there are several others that I mentioned in the, in the statement, but we, we didn't take advantage of any of them because two things. The administration in truth started to turn its attention to Iraq. And second, uh, once you do that, there wasn't enough, uh, what would you say, a center of gravity in the administration left to really steer things towards a successful collusion in Afghanistan. It is difficult for the U.S. government to do major issues simultaneously. We can do them on seriatim, but simultaneously it gets a little tough. Yes, sir. We can't chew gum and walk at the same time. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I, uh, I would ask the ambassadors, too. Uh, we keep hearing about the nation building and how our focus changed from getting al-Qaeda and getting bin Laden and to this nation building. We had all this USAID 
money and staff and personnel and resources there trying to do these projects. Some were in response to military ask, but they seem so disjointed. How could we have been more coordinated and better in our efforts instead of, you know, one-offs all across the spectrum? I'll, I'll take a first crack at that, if I might. Uh, Congresswoman, I think you go to the, the heart of the issue here. Uh, my colleagues have spoken of the uh, rampant corruption uh, in Afghanistan, certainly true. Same thing in Iraq, uh, actually worse because uh, they had a lot more money. Uh, the hard truth is if you overthrow a regime, uh, its institutions, such as they were, uh, and their body of law goes with it. So you are in a situation where there are no respected institutions. There is no respect for rule of law because there isn't rule of law. And then you pour a bunch of money in on top of it. So guaranteed, you're going to get corruption. I, I hope we've learned that lesson and are uh, parsing through it to, to the extent that it deserves. And here it's got to be broader than the special inspector generals, as uh, 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 focused and uh, uh, significant as they may have been. They, they, they get too technical. It needs to be raised up to a strategic level. And of course, uh, since the inspectors general report to Congress, Congress is in a position to do something about this. Uh, so uh, in terms of coordination within an administration, uh, we've also brought this forward, that uh, the, the military operates on a very short cycle for phase four activities post-conflict. Uh, uh, lots of money right now for immediate results. USAID, uh, with a very small fraction of the funding available, uh, operates or tries to operate on a longer term. So we're going to have to find a way to uh, 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 figure out how the military SERP funding. I lost Jim, sorry. Would be we lost you know, the element right away. Okay, we lost the last 15 seconds, uh, Ambassador. Uh, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, we are. So can you sum up your last 15 seconds? We didn't hear that answer. Uh, we need to find a better way to synchronize uh, the military's SERP funding, phase four funding imperatives, which are for results right now, uh, into a longer term USAID focus on, on uh, development and strategy. So knitting those two together uh, toward a whole of government effort, I think, would be a, uh, an early and important task uh, for Congress to consider undertaking. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. I yield back. The gentleman's gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman yields back. And I now recognize Representative Brian Mast of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, ambassadors. Thank you, General. Thank you, Chairman, for yielding me the time. Uh, some of you have answered some questions. Some of you have answered other questions. I want to ask a few new ones and repeat a few uh, the old questions and uh, kind of get a survey because not everybody's answered the same question. A little bit of survey in the affirmative or the negative about how you feel about some of the different uh, occurrences. We lost you, Mr. Mass. Mr. Mass, we lost you. Oh. Now you're back. Can you hear me now. Now we hear you. All right. Perfect. I'm glad I'm back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just going to go down the line in alphabetical order with Ambassador Armitage, then Crocker, then Luton, then General McMaster, so we don't step on each other. We'll do it in alphabetical order. Um, going back before... Uh, I think we've lost you again. Mr. Mass. I think we lost Hello. you again, Mr. Mass. I wish I knew why. It says I got full internet here. <laughs> I don't know. Let's try it again. Go ahead. Let's, all right, let's time, try it again. Give me a question. Oh, I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. We didn't lose too much. Um, I wanted to ask, President Biden said on inauguration, I'm going to make mistakes, 
When I make them, I will acknowledge them and I will tell you. Do you all believe that he's acknowledged his mistakes with Afghanistan? Ambassador Armitage? No, Mr. Master, I don't. I think he's uh, acknowledged his rather valiant decision to get out, which took some courage, but it was the total evacuation was totally full bar. And I don't think many people have owned up to that yet. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Crocker? I, I agree completely. Thank you, sir. Ambassador Lute? The president has said a couple of times the buck stops here, but it's not clear what happens to the buck after it stops with the president. So I, I haven't seen sort of corrective action um, that, yes, sir. Uh, that would indicate uh, good moves. Yes, sir. General? No, I don't think so. I, I have never, I, I don't think ever seen such a disconnect between what our leaders tell us about what was happening uh, in a place in, in Afghanistan during this crisis and what was actually happening on the ground. And I think that hypocrisy has reached kind of a, a unprecedented levels. Uh, in the same speech announcing our adherence to the timeline that we gave to the Taliban as part of our capitulation agreement, saying that human rights were an important part of our policy, for example, and, and the list goes on. Uh, so I think it's uh, tremendously disappointing. Thank you, General. I uh, want to move to a different date, April 9th. Uh, Office of Director of National Intelligence released its annual threat assessment where they said the Taliban is likely to make gains on the battlefield and the Afghan government will struggle to hold the Taliban at bay if the coalition withdraws support. Uh, do you all believe that President Biden received that report? It would be hard for me to believe, Congressman, that he hadn't received it because we had been saying things of that nature as a bureaucracy since 2005, 2006, and it only Thank got you, Ambassador. worse. Ambassador Crocker. Uh, I, I know little of how Washington works. I wish I knew even less. Uh, hard for me to believe he would not be aware of that. Thank it'd you, be, sir. It'd be my assumption he knew as well. Thanks, sir. General? I don't, I don't know. I just don't know what the process is that's being used to give the president best analysis and to give the president multiple options with an assessment of the advantages and disadvantages of those options. I'm, I'm, I just I don't know. Thank you, General. Uh, I want to move to another date. Uh, April 14th, President Biden announced that we would withdraw from Afghanistan by September 11th, the anniversary. Do you believe that choosing that day was about optics? Pastor Armitage. Congressman, I believe that picking September 11th was waving a red flag in front of a bull. Ambassador Crocker. Uh, I, I felt like I had received a physical blow uh, when he named that date, that 20 years after the horrors of 9-11 that we all witnessed, uh, that he would choose that date over all others for the final U.S. evacuation. I think he realized it too eventually and, and changed the calendar. Yeah, I, I, I have no basis on to judge why that date was picked. It, it certainly didn't make sense. General? I, I think it was an affront uh, to all those who served. And I think that making that announcement as he did in Area 60 of Arlington Cemetery really, really uh, reveals kind of an astonishing misunderstanding of what it means to serve uh, in, in, in our military and, and the fact that soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines don't want to be pitied. What they want is they want leaders who are dedicated to achieving an outcome that's worthy of the sacrifices that they make in, in war. I think it's worth pointing out that you know September 11th is exactly the anniversary the Taliban wanted. For anybody who missed it, the Taliban ran on all television stations in Kabul uh, a, a show called Victoria Force 3 where it blamed the United States for 9-11 uh, for bringing the attacks on themselves and again denied the fact that Al-Qaeda had any role. I thank you all for your answers, uh, Mr. Chairman. I believe my time has expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas, who's the chairman of the Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global uh, Corporate Social Impact for five minutes. Sure. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony and for being here with us virtually today. Uh, Secretary, Deputy Secretary Amitage, uh, it's great to see you again. I think we last saw each other at the Mount Fuji Dialogue a few years ago in Japan. And I had a question for you that's a little bit involved, uh, but I wanna, I wanna ask it. Uh, you know, in your opening statement, you mentioned 
that then Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, uh, did not carry through on the elimination of the Arabs and the Taliban in Afghanistan, and that they were allowed to escape to Pakistan following the Tora Bora campaign. Why do you suspect that Secretary Rumsfeld did not follow through on this campaign? There was some reporting at the time that discussed the Kunduz airlift, uh, claiming that the Bush administration approved of a plan to allow the Pakistanis to evac evacuate Pakistani officers embedded with the Taliban back to safety uh, from Kunduz, along with Taliban and al-Qaeda fighters. What can you tell us about the Kunduz airlift and your thinking at the time, and now about the role Pakistan played in keeping the Taliban alive during those years? Well, the latter part first, Congressman, uh, that Pakistan uh, provided food, sustenance, and everything else to the to the, the uh, Taliban. I'm speaking specifically of ISI. Uh, culminated in the fact that uh, Osama bin Laden was living in Abbottabad uh, for so long. Not fathomable that the, that the Pakistanis didn't know about it. I would be extraordinarily disappointed if I knew there was a, a, a an agreement that the Pakistan's embedded with the Talibs would be allowed to escape. However, that is not saying that there weren't Pakistanis embedded. Sultan Amir uh, Imam was the chief trainer of the Taliban, and I've known him, knew him for a number of years. He's been killed by, ironically enough, uh, an uh, extremist group. Uh, and as to why Mr. Rumsfeld did not prosecute this or General Franks, I don't know, but I sure would invite you to have General Franks testify, sir. Uh, thank you, Deputy Secretary. And then for anyone on the panel, a question on Afghanistan. You know, as you look back over the course of the two-decade U.S. experience in Afghanistan, uh, what do you think that we accomplished and what opportunities were missed? And you know, what do you think are the main lessons learned from the American inter intervention in Afghanistan on nation building, on providing development assistance, on joint civil military operations, and how do they apply to other situations? I know we only have two and a half minutes left on my time. But I pose that for whoever would like to take a shot at any of those pieces of that question. I think our longest term impact uh, was through our support for education, particularly for uh, female education. Uh, we have a generation that has grown up, again, in a, uh, uh, a free media environment um, with a, a, a curriculum that is not dictated by a, uh, an autocrat. Uh, so you have, a, again, an entire generation in their, uh, in their 20s and maybe early 30s uh, for whom the norm is an open society. Uh, we just quit on them too soon before they were in a position to uh, undertake a major societal change. I think if I can weigh in on that, Congressman, uh, I think we used the 20 years to accomplish a great deal in terms of making our country more safe. I mean, we have counterterrorism capabilities today, both in terms of detecting terrorists and doing something about them uh, that really stretches across the globe. Uh, here at home, we're a much harder target uh, than we were on 9-11. Uh, we have a network of counterterrorism partners that didn't exist uh, on 9-11. Uh, and then, frankly, we've caused very heavy attrition. I would say decimated core al-Qaeda. So the leadership that on 9-11 was in Afghanistan and Pakistan. That part of al-Qaeda has been decimated. It's not eliminated, it's not zero, but it's a fraction of what it was. So we've actually used, I think, the last 20 years to make ourselves safer. I'd, I'd agree with that. I'd say that in the beginning, I said that we're in a more dangerous situation than we were on September 10th, 2001. The reason we're not seeing attacks like 9-11 are because of our defensive capabilities that we've developed, I think. But these groups are growing stronger. And I think to get to your question, I think we're learning exactly the wrong lessons. We're on a path to anyway. And I think that a lot of the conventional wisdom about Afghanistan is actually completely wrong. And especially in connection with the idea that, you know, nation building is a dirty word. Well, hey, the consolidation of gains to get the sustainable political outcomes in war has never been an optional phase in war. It is if you're doing a military raid, which is a, an operation of limited purpose and short duration and planned withdrawal. But as, as the historian Conrad Crane has said, we have never been able to never do it again. And I think it was our, 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 our desire to not do it, to disengage quickly, uh, that actually set us up uh, for failure in the long term. Thank you. This is expired. I now recognize Representative Tim Burchett of Tennessee for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can y'all hear me now? We hear you. All right, right on. Uh, there's reports that the ISIS K member who killed the 13 Americans, including one of my constituents, a man named Ryan Kanas, the one member of the United States Army, and um, over 150 Afghans at, at, at Ahmed Karzai International Airport was released from the Bagram Air Base when the Taliban took control. I think this terrible loss of life could have been prevented if the administration had transferred some of the or all these prisoners to another location. And I think the administration needs to answer for their reckless decision to leave a Bagram in the middle of the night. What do y'all think? Uh, why do you think there was no plan to secure and transfer these prisoners? I'll just answer quickly and then turn over to colleagues here. I think because that the mission given to, to uh, I, I think, the military, and maybe this is a question to ask you know, our senior military people, Secretary Austin, the mission wasn't to get every American out. The mission wasn't to get every, you know, every uh, allied citizen out who was helping us as part of the coalition or to get Afghans out who were going to be brutalized when we departed. And the mission wasn't uh, to, to mitigate, really, the, what we knew was going to be a disaster on a complete withdrawal. The mission was to get the hell out to withdraw on this timeline and to adhere to these troop levels. And once that becomes your mission in the end, we shouldn't be surprised by any of this. We should not have been surprised either by that attack on, 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 the, on the airport uh, that, that killed 13 of our servicemen and women and, and over well over 100 Afghans. But the Haqqanis, right? Siraj Haqqani was in charge of security at, at the airport. They've been running the Kabul attack network uh, for, for over a decade. They, 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 we think of these groups as distinct, but they have lines of communication and often cooperate with, with even ISIS-K. I think this was a deliberate effort. I don't have evidence for this, but I think a, that was a deliberate effort to humiliate us on our way out. And when we heard our leaders saying we're cooperating with the Taliban on security, that ought to be stomach turning to all of us. We actually ceded our agency because we stuck with a surrender agreement to the terrorists. And guess what, what happens when you surrender to terrorists? This, this is what happens. All right. I agree with you. Um, that sort of leads into my next question. You might have answered it, and some of the others want to jump in. That's fine. Um, their thoughts on the Biden administration relying on the Taliban to provide security around the Hamad Karzai airport. I guess that's pretty much in line with, with what you just said. Any of the others like to comment on that? It's a question of mission, and if the mission was, as I understand it was, uh, to get out under extremely dire circumstances, American citizens and others who had helped the American effort, uh, if, if that's the mission, then you're going to have to talk to the Taliban. Well, did the Taliban, were, were they uh, instrumental in us getting out? I mean, were they helping us all along? Uh, I would be highly skeptical if, if that were the case. Uh, uh, but that would have to be a question, really, for those directly involved in these operations. Okay. I'll, I'll just point out that my phone is full of WhatsApp messages from Afghans and, and U.S. residents and U.S. citizens who were brutalized at, at Taliban checkpoints on their way to the airport and couldn't get out. And many of them are still stranded there now. About a thousand of them that we're tracking are still str str stranded there now. So the picture that you heard and that was painted in press conferences in Washington was completely the opposite of what was actually going on in Kabul. And I'm sure there are many others besides me who have that, have had that same experience communicating with Afghans on the ground uh, under those dire conditions during the evacuation. Yeah, Congressman, let me just weigh in on this one. You, you know, the SIV program has underperformed for more than a decade. Uh, and we've never reached the quotas. We've never really paid attention. It's become a lot of red tape and bureaucracy. And so it has underperformed. Uh, what's curious to me is that after the Doha agreement was signed with the Taliban in February 2020, that we did not at that point accelerate evacuation of the SFEs, scale down our embassy and so forth, because we had a president of the United States who said, we're getting out on May 1st. Now, it turns out that date was extended a bit. It was reaffirmed by his successor. It was then extended by several months. But we had at least 18 months from February of 2020 to make progress on SIV evacuations and so forth, and American citizen evacuations. To this day, this, and this is some data that's recently reached my, my phone, uh, HR, uh, there are 35 Afghans who are active duty service members in the American military 
and their families are still in Afghanistan, not covered by the SIB program. There are hundreds of Afghan commandos, the fraction of the Afghan army that actually did fight until the last day, who are also not covered by the SIV program, and they're still in Afghanistan. So this program is bigger than currently advertised. Yeah, I'm, my time's up. Uh, yeah, time has expired. I'm in East Tennessee, and we've got 17 folks that we now, now got. I now recognize Representative Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. I, I want to reiterate what someone said previously, which is this has been really an enlightening conversation, and I really appreciate all of the feedback and, and balanced conversation from uh, decades' worth of experience in, in Afghanistan. Ambassador Crocker, you mentioned in your testimony and highlighted specific areas in the Biden administration where we should be uh, developing plans at this point in time to address uh, protecting humanitarian workers and women and girls. And Mr. McMaster, you also mentioned that this is the time where we have the opportunity to give people who have been left behind a voice. And specifically in your testimony, um, Ambassador Crocker, you said in 2001, only 800,000 children were in school, all of whom were boys. But in 2012, 8 million children were in school, 35% of whom were in girls. And in August, the Taliban has stated that girls would still be allowed to attend school, but has uh, since then shown no inclination to honor those rights. Uh, while secondary schools for boys have opened, the Taliban has not made any announcements regarding when girls will be allowed back to secondary schools. Uh, starting with you, Ambassador, what recommendations would you have to offer, off, uh, offer ways to continue to support Afghan women and minority groups and girls in the country? And what steps can we in the United States make to effectively engage the Taliban on principled humanitarian access, particularly with regards to access to education? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I think we, we need to start uh, with an acknowledgement that uh, we created this situation. Uh, we did not lose militarily in Afghanistan. Uh, we were not forced out. We just decided we were tired and we wanted to go home. And that has put at risk literally half of the Afghan population, female half. Uh, unless we're prepared to uh, accept that responsibility, I think it's hard to have any kind of uh, honest effort at ameliorating anything. Uh, that said, you have to look forward. We cannot uh, rewind the film, uh, unfortunately. Uh, this is where I think we would have to try to orchestrate a multilateral uh, effort uh, that says to the Taliban, uh, if you don't do X, Y, Z, you're getting nothing from us. Uh, now, they're only getting humanitarian aid, uh, but uh, to, 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 to stiffen that up, I think this would be one of those rare occasions, for me at least, where we turn to the United Nations. Uh, to press them to bring in a really strong special representative of the Secretary General, uh, someone like Stefan de Mistura, with whom I had the pleasure of working with in Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't often have nice things to say about the United Nations, uh, but uh, someone like Stefan de Mistura or de Mistura himself to step in to run UN operations on the ground with a view toward ameliorating uh, uh, Taliban overreach. That, that is what I would propose at this point. And if it's okay, if I could pause and ask a second question unrelated to the first, I'm curious with what remains of my time about how well prepared and willing the Afghan forces were at various points in time in the last 20 years of the con uh, conflict. So with what remains of my time, if I could ask each of you just a few words on how well prepared you thought the Afghan security forces were during the time that you served in Afghanistan. Was there any point during those ta ta that time where the Taliban, where I'm sorry, the Afghan forces could have held against a Taliban take? Over and I'll start if it's okay uh, with Mr. Armitage. I don't think they could have stood up on their own completely. We had never completed uh, a supply system for them where they were in charge. Uh, there, much was made of their avionics and their aviation activities, but not so noteworthy. So, without U.S. assistance, I don't think they were able to stand up. Thank you. And Mr. Mr. McMaster, on that same question, would you uh, point at a point in time where you thought during your service uh, in the region that they were able to withhold a, an attack against, with the Taliban? No. And, and that's uh, that's in large measure because of these criminalized patronage networks that had become stakeholders in the weakness of state institutions, because the weakness of those institutions gave them impunity to steal and build up their power base in advance of the U.S. Afghanistan. 
And so that didn't remain static. I believe there was some progress made, especially in the Ministry of Defense after that, especially in the Special Operations Forces. But at no time that I'm aware of could the Afghan forces have withstood this orchestrated ISI, we should mention this, the ISI planned offensive uh, against uh, the Afghan government uh, and security forces. And thank you. And Mr. And Ambassador Lute, with the remaining seconds of my time, how about during your time? Yeah, what I would mention is that we got, to a very, we got off to a very slow start. We didn't begin to invest seriously in the Afghan National Security Forces until the end of the Bush administration and the first several years of Obama. Thank you. And my time has expired, gentlemen. I appreciate your time, and I yield back, Mr. Chair. The gentlelady yields back. I now recognize Representative Mark Green, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere, Civilian Security, Migration, and International Economic Policy for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Meeks and Ranking Member McCollum. Thank you to our <clears throat> witnesses for being here today and testifying, but more importantly for your many years of public service. I think most Americans get that the execution of the withdrawal has left us wounded internationally. It's harmed our allies. Most importantly, it's left American citizens behind enemy lines. But 20 years of mistakes are not an excuse for a bad withdrawal. It certainly doesn't justify the material support, $85 billion worth of military equipment given to a terrorist organization. But I've spoken about this many times, and today I'd really like to focus on the future. Uh, General McMaster, my first question is for you, and I'd like to ask sort of a uh, satellite view question. Now, I enjoyed your book. One of the points you made was that the U.S. has had 20 one-year-long strategies throughout the war. You know, also I see over the past 10 years our, our political parties seem to be dividing. Uh, ideologically, there's there's less overlap than there was 10 years ago. Given our history, our, our current division, which, by the way, our strategic partners are zeroing in on, how do we draft long-term strategies of country, not just specific to this region, although this region is really critical, CCP, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, that whole, but how do, how do we as a nation, you know, come together and, and and look at having a, a long-term strategy. Gosh, you know, I th thank you, Representative Green. It really it starts with leadership, a leadership, a leadership uh, at the presidential level, uh, and then it really in the national security structure uh, run by the National Security Advisor to coordinate and integrate efforts across the departments and agencies to first understand the complex challenges we're facing internationally. I think this is a step that is often skipped, and I think it was skipped too often in Afghanistan. I mean, we actually in Afghanistan conjured up the enemy we would prefer to fight rather than the actual enemy that we were fighting. And much of our strategy was based on that, as also based on unrealistic assumptions about what drove and constrained the Pakistani army leadership and its behavior. So I think framing complex challenges first, design thinking, and then what's really Really important for Americans today on, on across the political spectrum is to understand the so what? Why the hell do I care about this, right? And so identifying what vital interests are at stake, viewing that challenge through the, through the lens of the vital interests and crafting clearly articulated goals and more specific objectives. And then the step that is skipped, I think oftentimes, that comes back to bite us is assumptions. Assumptions about the degree to which we and like-minded partners have agency and influence over this challenge. And then, of course, identifying op opportunities and, 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 to, and, and obstacles to overcome. Uh, and that, that, then you can frame out a strategy and have a meaningful discussion uh, about really what the American people need to know more than anything. What is at stake? And then what is a strategy that will deliver a favorable outcome at an acceptable cost and risk? That's been missing. And that's the strategic competence I'm talking about and I allude to in the statement for the record. Well, thank, thanks for the answer on that. I, I, one of the things that uh, myself and a colleague across the aisle, uh, Dean Phillips, we're, we're creating this thing called uh, a uh, journal club where Democrats and Republicans sit down and instead of just getting the five minutes where we vomit our questions and, you know, we actually have a dialogue. And uh, my, my question to all of our witnesses, we are, we're going to have our first one coming up next month. And uh, Richard Haas has agreed to bring one of the articles he's written to that and discuss it. Of course, I, I extend the invitation to all my colleagues on the on the panel. And I know Dean does as well on the on the committee to join this. I, my question to all of you is, would you consider joining us, uh, you know, as a guest speaker at our one of our future journal clubs, I would Absolutely. certainly be honored. I think we can of be course. ten of us on that. Well, thank you, thank you for that. You know, the goal here is dialogue because 
for us to have my perception is for us to have a, an effective strategy as a nation. You know, we we got to agree on some stuff, and we got to talk about what we don't agree on, and then maybe we won't wind up like we have the last twenty years with a new strategy every year. Um, Mr. Chairman, the clock was for me, and I don't know. Do I have any time? Yeah, you a have minute or a minute thirty. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, question to really one: How is the basically? I don't know if anyone could understand that. You broke up, Mr. Green. Okay, I'll ask it again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real quickly, uh, how is the PRC and Pakistan's relationship going to change? How is the PRC-Afghanistan relationship going to change under the new reality? Well, that's a critical question. The, the PRC is going to uh, carefully uh, move forward because of something that Ambassador Crocker mentioned, uh, their soft underbelly uh, with the Uyghurs. Uh, in the West. So uh, they, although they approach this, uh, our departure with a certain amount of schadenfreude, uh, it is the case, I think, that they know it's not an open playing field for them. They will, however, uh, continue to support Pakistan, which could lead them to trouble. And right now, the, the difficulties between Pakistan and China are very real. They're not shooting at each other, but they are fighting with each other in the mountains. Uh, that's a great, uh, and real quickly, and maybe this question will, will just be out there and you guys can get back with me offline. I have suggested Northwest India as a location for some over-the-horizon stuff. That wound up getting all in the India press. I wound up on the Today Show in India, I guess. But um, I would love to get your thoughts, perhaps in writing, to the idea of Northwest India for over-the-horizon. Gentlemen's time has now expired. Um I would now recognize Representative D Dean Phillips of Minnesota for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to my friend and colleague, Mr. Green, for extending that invitation. And I have duly noted your acceptance of that invitation and look forward to uh, you joining us and all of our colleagues as well. I want to thank all of our witnesses uh, for your service to our great nation, uh, to my colleagues, many of whom are on this call who have worn the uniform. Uh, and have made remarkable sacrifices for all of us. And as a gold star son myself who lost his dad in Vietnam, uh, I want to remind all of us there are thousands of gold star families out there uh, who know pain uh, that few of us can possibly imagine as we talk about Afghanistan. Uh, Secretary Armitage, uh, we've shined some light today and in the past weeks on how corruption uh, undermines our efforts around the world, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, in other parts of the globe. Uh, and I really appreciate your earlier comments about how we need to review and affirm our national interests uh, and increase congressional oversight uh, relative to corruption uh, and how we distribute our financial resources around the world. Uh, most of you know that the uh, 2018 NDAA required that state, DOD, and USAID develop a joint strategy for preventing corruption in reconstruction efforts in contingency operations uh, it was a report that was due in June of 2018, over three years ago, and we have yet to receive it, yet to receive it. Uh, I've raised this matter on multiple occasions. It has been highlighted by Mr. Sopko, of course, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, but we are still awaiting that. Corruption is undermining our efforts. Uh, it must be addressed. Uh, and Secretary, you also made an astute observation that one of the reasons uh, we failed to leave Afghanistan perhaps sooner uh, was the result of political fear of losing a war. Uh, in quoting you, that the instinct to keep up the fight won over the need to critically review our interests, and that the effort would have benefited from more intense congressional oversight, end quote. I agree with you. Uh, I think here in Congress we have the same fears. So with that in mind, Mr. Secretary, you know, what do you think Congress should have done 10, 15 years ago, perhaps, uh, to address that political cost, uh, especially amongst those who campaign to be tough on, on national security. And what additional oversight should Congress be pursuing prospectively uh, as we move forward? A congressman, I might be a victim of my past, like I'm sure you are of yours. I worked in the Senate side for Bob Dole, as is what we used to call AA in the old days, chief of staff now. 
I do want to mention the, the congressional oversight first, because it's not just a matter, in my view, of HVAC. It's also the Armed Services Committee. There's a different kind of corruption. When we say corruption, most of us think of money or ghost soldiers or officers who don't give the payout to the, to the enlisted, uh, which happened in Vietnam and happened here. That's another kind of corruption. There's a corruption in the armed forces. How many armed uh, leaders did we have in Afghanistan in the first, say, 12 years of our conflict? General McMaster's may actually, or General Lute may actually know the number. Uh, it's close to 10. Scott Miller, the last one, was the longest one we've had. So that leads to a certain, I've got to get my merit badge now, I've got to make my uh, my mark now, etc. And it doesn't always leave, I think, room for good choices. A lot, I mean, Doug knows, HR knows, a lot of our, our activities in the Corongal Valley, things that were highlighted in the book Red Platoon, this is a, a corruption of our armed forces. We didn't do as, as officers what we needed to do to take care of our troops. So don't I mean, pigeonhole, I think, just into uh, HVAC. It's, it's a can, it, it, can, I, can I just go on the record? Can I just go on the record to re to to reject that <laughs> that senior officers who commanded in Afghanistan did it for a merit badge? I mean, really? Did you just say that? <laughs> yep. I not only say it, I'd repeat it again. And I've said it at NDU at the classes I teach there. Actually, Mr. Mr. Armitage, I, I'd like to reclaim my time to speak. Mr. McMaster, I, I, I'd like to hear your, your, your perspective. I've got 40 seconds left. Yeah, I, I, th I think that the, you know, this, this idea of over-optimism and confirmation bias, it was clearly there. Uh, I think, though, to say that any of our senior commanders were there to do anything but to accomplish the mission and to do so at a minimal cost to their soldiers is disparaging in a way that is completely ungrounded you know, in, in reality. Because uh, I know these people now. Right. Now I, I do think that that there was there there was this tendency to to always you know show progress. This is not a new phenomenon. I wrote about this extensively in connection with the Vietnam War. But I'll tell you, one one of my jobs was to pull the curtain back on the infiltration and corruption of of, of state institutions and functions in Afghanistan. Those reports are work. I'm sure is available if you can just get it declassified. And and uh, there was no effort that I saw to to cover that up. There was a reluctance to deal with it from Washington because Washington again had created their delusion, right? Their illusion of Afghanistan, what they wanted Afghanistan to be, and that was because they were prioritizing just getting the hell out. So I, I think that the, the danger is we're going to learn the, exactly the wrong lesson that we should have just left. When the fact is the problem is from the very beginning. We took a short-term approach to a long-term problem, which paradoxically you. lengthened the war and made it more costly. Thank Thank you, sir. Time's expired. We can continue this conversation at our journal club. I yield back. I now recognize Representative Dan Musa of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do appreciate my colleagues' remarks very much. And, um, sirs, uh, thank you very much for your testimony, service to our country, and for your what I consider to be very, very honorable uh, responses here. Uh, that being said, the Biden administration's flawed execution of the withdrawal from Afghanistan has been a disastrous situation and with uh, terrible consequences. Uh, those with deep terrorist ties are now leading Afghanistan and gives us great reason for grave concern. Um, Ambassador Crocker, uh, you and ranking, ranking member McCall penned an op-ed in New York Times in May. She said it was likely that the Taliban would take control of the country and urging the Biden administration to engage regional partners and protect their embassy. Um, uh, based upon the uh, testimony uh, last week, it's clear that Generals McKenzie and Milley recommended leaving a residual force of 2,500 troops in Afghanistan, which would have been enough, according to General McKenzie, to keep Bagram. In your view, why did the administration, this is to Ambassador Crocker, why, uh, in your view, did the Biden administration follow the course it did? Um, uh, what did you know that the Biden administration either did not know or did not acknowledge? I, I uh, cannot speak to what the Biden administration uh, knew or didn't know or did or didn't do, uh, clearly. Uh, it seems to me, though, that uh, the president was determined to get out of Afghanistan, period, uh, to get it off his plate. If you don't have deployed forces, it's a second tier issue. Somebody else can worry about it. And I fear that that uh, blinded him to some of the obvious consequences. 
while the risks were were somewhat clear that there would be an overrun by a terrorist group that's just that's just hard to uh, hard to digest uh, general right. McMaster yeah um, you also wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed at the end of July that the conditions in Afghanistan exposed the flawed assumptions of the Biden administration's plan. In the same article, you suggest the United States should not adhere to the Doha agreement, so that the Taliban was clearly violating the agreement itself. Uh, why did, in your view, General, the Biden administration proceed with the withdrawal as planned? I guess that's a similar question to Ambassador Crocker, but... What is your thought? Why would they proceed it, it, with with the information that was at hand? Well, I, I can't, I'm not sure what they were thinking, but I do think it was because they prioritized withdrawal, as, as, as Ambassador Crocker said, and then as a result, didn't consider, you know, what I think were quite obvious uh, disastrous consequences associated with that precipitous withdrawal. And then this whole idea that we had to adhere to it, to an agreement with the Taliban that they were, that they were breaking since it was inked in, in February of 2020, uh, when they were engaged in a massive assassination campaign. Remember the, you know, the bombing of the girls' schools? Remember the attack on a maternity hospital? And the other mass murder attacks across the country as the intimidation began after we gave them our, ske our schedule for withdrawal. So I, I think the idea that we had to adhere to this agreement to keep good faith with the Taliban is actually just ludicrous. Thank you. What about accountability? I want to ask you about accountability. The American people, my constituents, are very, very frustrated. They're demanding some sort of accountability. And then we see, of course, Lieutenant Colonel Scheller um, is in the brig. Uh, uh, receiving accountability and penalties for calling out the mistakes that were made. And granted, we, we, we know that there was some, some violations in there. The treatment seems w overly harsh, to say the least. But what account about accountability for what, what's occurred here in Afghanistan, in its aftermath, in the withdrawal, in the deaths of, of, of soldiers, um, uh, do, are we going to allow these the same who are making these decisions to continue making decisions? Will we see, in your view, General, any accountability? Well, I think for the military, what's really important is to keep the bold line in place between our military and 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 partisan politics and partisan political issues, or or just political issues broadly. Nobody elects generals or lieutenant colonels to make policy, and I think it's important for those who are serving in uniform, uh, in particular, to understand their role. Right. And who, who they are and what their role is. Their job is to, is to do the best they can to, to execute the orders that they're given at the low at the lower levels, but also to give your chain of command the benefit of your best advice. If you think something is really, really screwed up, you can sound off, but you do it through your chain of command, not to influence policy outside of your chain of command because you're not accountable to the American people in doing that in trying to have this loud voice in a way that influences policy as a serving military officer. I believe you actually undermine the Constitution of the United States. So I guess the question is, and I've seen some of the hearings in the Senate and in the House on this with the, with the Armed Services Committee, you know, really just trying to determine, was best military advice accessed by the president? I wrote a book on how why Vietnam became an American war. Uh, and during that period, Lyndon Johnson got the military advice he wanted and structured his relationship with the senior military to, to get what he wanted to hear. Uh, was this a case with President Biden? I, I don't know. And, and, and I think that, that uh, certainly Congress is going to help determine better how these decisions were made and what advice was given. Thank you. Chairman, I yield back. Appreciate it. I now it. recognize Representative Colin Allred of Texas for five minutes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, I want to thank our uh, panel for their service and, you know, this hearing, uh, the purpose is supposed to be to discuss our, our 20 years in Afghanistan. And I know sort of the, the easy reach here uh, is to attack President Biden and our withdrawal, recognizing, though, that the last seven months are not what we really should be talking about here in this setting. I think that we need to learn some lessons uh, that will help us learn how to not you know, get ourselves stuck in another couple of decades of nation building or uh, whatever we were trying to do in Afghanistan in another you know, volatile region of the world. And I think we do need to have some level setting from what I've been hearing. You know, one of the things about being one of the more junior members of the committee is you have to listen to a lot of people speak first. They ask all of your questions, but you can respond to some things that have been said. Uh, and I think it's good to level set with the American people watching this uh, to say that and to place the last few months 
in context. You know, first, that when President Biden took office in January, the Taliban was the strongest that they'd been, both in terms of men, material, and territory, since our invasion. Uh, second, he inherited a deal to withdraw all of our troops within three months at a troop level that was known to not be sustainable uh, and something that the previous um, president had you know, publicly talked about, that that was not going to be sustainable and difficult uh, to reverse. And third, that the Afghan government and security forces were, as we've discussed, riddled with corruption and competence and you know, broadly seen as illegitimate. So any discussion that you know, I think tries to indicate that the status quo could have been maintained with just a few thousand Americans is something I, I deeply disagree with. I also disagree that we have not been patient enough. I think 20 years is a lot of patience uh, from the American people. And uh, there is, as the president has said, there's no such thing as a low-grade war. Uh, there's always going to be uh, terrible consequences. Uh, and I think it misses the broader point uh, that it was time for us uh, to end our longest conflict. Now, I, I want to talk about how we ended up in such a long conflict and why um, we continued to throw more into this, uh, because I, I do you know, wonder uh, what you all think we were doing the last 10 years uh, in Afghanistan after uh, our, you know, taking out Osama bin Laden, you know, what our, our goals were there. And, it, and I know that when I was in, uh, visited Afghanistan in November 2019, it was clear to me that our military could carry out any mission we gave them uh, there, and that they were carrying out their mission. They were working with Afghan special forces who were very good at their job as well. But that, you know, degrading the Taliban and, and the attempts that we were doing wasn't working. In fact, it seemed like we were creating more uh, folks uh, joining their side at, at times, and certainly that they were gaining strength and gaining territory, despite the fact that they could not compete with us in any way, shape, or form uh, militarily. And so I'm wondering how, for us in the Congress, we can best, uh, going forward, provide oversight, and how... Uh, those of you who are, who are no longer in these positions can help us understand where the, the points of entry are uh, for us to, to have these kinds of discussions while we're in these conflicts. Because I think back to the 2009 debate uh, around the surge, which uh, you know, our military commanders uh, you know, were supportive of, and, and of course that decision was reached with some opposing and some supporting it. Uh, but I wonder about the decision-making process there and whether or not uh, our civil system is, has the ability, really, uh, to intervene and to, at times, yes, take into uh, consideration uh, the military situation. But when there is no military solution, where we can best um, you know, exert our control as a civilian-controlled uh, you know, military that has different goals and that understands that in the end, uh, this is not going to be something that uh, the military is going to be capable of on their own. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, Mr. Master General Master, if you would maybe, uh, could you begin there? What, what do you think, uh, in having been in some of these rooms, what do you think uh, those discussions went wrong? What do you think that we in the Congress could do better to provide that oversight? You know, I, I know this is going to be controversial to say, but I think, I think it is unethical to fight a war without trying to win. And then I, I know what the Ambassador Crocker said earlier, I, I respect his, his point of view on this, but you can define what winning is. And you said, what were you there to achieve? We're, what we were achieving there is preventing what we're seeing happening right now, and which I think was worth it, right? The very relatively small amount of commitment we've gotten down to, uh, the, a multinational effort that was sustainable over time as an insurance policy to prevent Afghanistan from again becoming a haven for jihadist terrorist organizations. We essentially surrendered to a terrorist state, uh, and and we're going to pay the we're seeing the consequences of we're lamenting the consequences. So I, I would say, Congressman, that you know I, I think that the reason why you know not trying to win, not being committed to that outcome, and, prof and continuously professing our priority to withdraw, we're leaving. We're really just leaving is because war is a contest of wills to, to win a war. We would have had to convince the Taliban they cannot accomplish their objectives through the use of force. And I know he just said, hey, there's no military solution in Afghanistan. Hey, well, hey, the Taliban came up with one, you know. And so I, I think I, I think we have to recognize that we we uh, we were just lacked the sustained commitment. And in doing so, we emboldened our enemies and we created a, you know, a, a crisis of confidence in our in our allies and our partners.
You know, General, I, I wonder, you know, I, I have to disagree with you a little bit there. I think we did sustain an effort for, yes, we shifted too much of our resources away uh, when we went into Iraq under uh, what turned out to be false pretenses. And we, you're right that we had a yearly strategy, but, but did, did, certainly did um, I wouldn't say that this is a military victory as much as it is that um, we were no longer, after 20 years, it was clear that we were not building up what we were told we were building up. And so I guess I'm wondering how the we as Congress know that. The gentleman's time has oh, expired. Okay, I yield back. I now recognize Representative Young Kim of California, who's the vice ranking member of the subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific Central Asia Nonproliferation for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Mix, and also Ranking Member McCall. I really want to thank our witnesses today for your uh, candid responses to my colleagues' excellent questions. And I appreciate this uh, spirited conversation. But I want to discuss U.S. policy moving forward, which is the focus of our hearing today on maintaining the strikes we made on many vulnerable populations, especially women and girls. You know, their success was due to our protection and support in the face of threats from the Taliban. I would like to um, direct my first questions to Ambassador Crocker. Now that we have fully withdrawn, what tools can the U.S. utilize to defend the hard-fought gains for women and girls in a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan? Sadly, uh, Congresswoman, those tools, I think, are very few and far between. Uh, we gave up agency in Afghanistan. Our mere presence there, even though we were no longer engaged in combat, was enough to sustain uh, uh, the efforts that women were making on their own behalf and enough to keep the Taliban at bay. Uh, we gave that up. It is not really replaceable. Uh, the best I can come up with is for the U.S. to try to orchestrate an international effort uh, that will have many voices speaking, as many as possible, um, that uh, the world still is watching, that the world cares what happens. Uh, and again, that's going to be hard to sustain because the administration, as I, as I see it, uh, simply want to change the subject. So if, if they are able to do that, there is not much we can do. Well, let me focus on that humanitarian side then. The Biden administration has said it will continue to serve the humanitarian needs of the Afghan people. So then, how can we effectively provide humanitarian assistance and meet the dire needs of the Afghan people without benefiting or legitimizing the Taliban-controlled government? Uh, that, in my view, would require, a, as I suggested earlier, a close consultation with the United Nations. Uh, some parts of the UN are effective. One of the most effective, in my experience, is the World Food Program, and the executive director is an American, uh, always has been. Uh, so that is an agency that is involved in the core of humanitarian efforts for the United Nations uh, that has a pretty good track record, and one, again, where uh, the, uh, the top person is an American citizen. Uh, we need to get a special representative of the Secretary General in the Kabul, uh, who is someone of uh, strength, integrity, and someone who can, uh, that we can work with. Uh, such people are out there. I mentioned one of them, Stefan de Mastura. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that, uh, I, I think we can certainly help support an international effort on humanitarian relief um, that, does not, uh, that does not empower the Taliban. Sure. And focus on make sh actually meeting the needs of the Afghan people and not being diverted to the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or foreign terrorist fighters entering into Afghanistan, right? Yes. And that, again, yes. requires very much the right person, because what we have seen in the past, unfortunately, with UN operations left to themselves, um, they are likely to follow the flow. If it takes sure. making nice with the Taliban, they're likely to do it. So getting the right people in up front, I think, is crucial. Sure. Let me ask you, uh, Secretary Armitage, as you know, the Afghanistan borders western Xinjiang province, a border crossing used by Uyghurs, fleeing the atrocities of the CCP. What is the fate of Uyghurs in Afghanistan under Taliban rule? And what is the PRC seeking from Taliban with respect to the Uyghurs? This is very important for me as I'm the uh, sponsor of the Uyghur Policy Act that just got out of the committee last week. It's an important issue. Congresswoman Kim, uh, it's very important to me as well. Um, I was uh, 
responsible in a large way during the Bush administration for the extraction of uh, Rabia Qadir and most of her children. One, of course, died, one child died. So I think the future for the Uyghurs in Afghanistan is very dim, and I think the future for the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province is very dim. Uh, all, it seems to be sort of a acceleration of the stories coming out of China mm -hmm. uh, about the terrible conditions, the number of Uyghurs that are under detention, what happens to them in detention. Uh, and it, it seems to be that this is going to be, and it should be, one of the ways we judge the bona fides of Xi Jinping. But I think it's their future is very dim. Uh, I know we're run running out of time, but I just wanted to quickly throw in another question. Do you see any prospect of PRC establishing a military presence in Afghanistan in the wake of U.S. withdrawal? The dear lady's time has expired. I'm not going to have time to get that one in. Um, I now recognize uh, Representative Abigail Spanberger of Virginia, the vice chair of the subcommittee on Europe, energy, the environment and cyber for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much to our witnesses for being with us today. Uh, 20 years ago, Congress passed the 2001 Authorization to Use of Military Force. It was really broadly written, and since then, uh, the authorization has been used by administrations of both parties for many years uh, to expand operations across countries uh, that really could have not been imagined in the wake of 9-11. And building upon the conversation that we've had today and the answers that, that you all have given, um, I'm curious, Secretary Armitage, if you could comment a little bit, if the 2001 AUMF had been more defined or narrower in scope, do you believe that this would have helped Congress and the executive branch focus our strategy in Afghanistan? And, and my goal in asking this question is, as we continue to talk about the current AUMFs on the books, but also proactively look into the future, I'd like to make sure that if there are uh, things we could have done better that we, we do indeed learn from the past. Congresswoman Spanberger, I would like to say, given my previous comment, that yeah, it would have been great to have really tight uh, oversight. Uh, and I do think, honestly, that successive administrations benefit from good, solid oversight. But I think that even with a narrow AUF, AUMF, uh, that because we at all, probably you yourself, had described this as a good war, like the Iraq war, which was a bad war, uh, that it would be kind of hard for members of Congress in the early teens, et cetera, to stand up against it. Um, I appreciate that. So I, I think we have to start from a different spot. Uh, and second, that members of Congress, we've even heard today from one member or another, oh, I've asked the administration to send letters here, and they don't answer. Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? Well, and so a little bit of follow up on that. If the AUMF had included a reauthorization requirement, um, do you think that that could have helped ensure that we were not really running on autopilot, kind of a, a, a reference to some of what we saw once um, the United States directed some of our energies towards Iraq and away from Afghanistan? Do you think that reauthorization requirement um, w would have been a, a forcing mechanism, positive, negative? What are your thoughts on that? My, my view, Congresswoman, is that uh, Congress and its powers has more than sufficient ability uh, to work their, their will, if they will, and it's called the well-known power of the purse. And I've been astonished as it, standing out here watching people at, from Congress say, oh, yeah, I wrote a letter. They owe me an answer three months ago, six months ago. Well, so do something about it. Talk to your friends on the Appropriations Committee. But so I don't think necessarily uh, that a reauthorization, stricter language would have done the job. I think it takes Congress standing up together and saying, here's the, what we see as our power of the purse. Here's what we must do. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And Ambassador Lute, you and Secretary Armitage both commented on how the United States uh, didn't properly or realistically assess the situation on the ground or really what goals were feasible. Um, and, and you noted there was a lack of, of humility factoring into some of these flawed assessments. Um, can you discuss how these uh, perhaps rosy assessments, especially regarding what could be achieved 
might have contributed to the idea that that significant gains were always around the corner um, and reflecting on what Secretary Armitage just said in terms of the type of oversight that Congress could have and, you know, I'll use the word should have been doing. Um, how could we have cut through some of these rosier assessments? Well, I think, Congresswoman, that the general trend was that after the quick fall of the Taliban in 2001 and then the political success coming out of Bonn, and the transition to Karzak government and the ratification of a new Afghan constitution. And the fact that this was a permissive security environment in 01, well, after the fall of the Taliban, but the remainder of 01, 02, and 03, um, up until the time that we diverted our attention to Iraq, I think it, it, it left grounds for optimism and sort of overly ambitious goals because it looked, it looked possible under that setting. The problem is, that we did not adequately, in my, in my view, tailor those goals over time as the situation changed. Uh, and we retained for too long lofty goals to build a state when resources were diverted to Iraq, uh, when we began to learn more and more about the underlying conditions in Afghanistan to include corruption and so forth, uh, and we took our time building the Afghan security forces. So over time, this gap emerged between what we are trying to achieve and the resources we are, we are mustering. So I think that's quite fundamental in the first six or eight years of the, of the campaign. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, to our other two witnesses, I'm sorry I didn't get to you, but I have greatly appreciated your feedback and your answers to uh, my colleagues' questions. Thank you all for being here. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. No way, this time has expired. I now recognize Representative Peter Meyer of Michigan for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and to our ranking member for holding this hearing today and for all of our witnesses who are gathered. Um, I actually want to follow up on something that my colleague from Virginia, Ms. Spamberger, said about the post-9-11 AUMF and specifically Ambassador Armitage's response. Um, <clears throat> well, obviously, the power of the purse is a powerful one. The way it's oftentimes bundled is with the NDAA, and we all know the political games around that. You know, you vote against it. You vote against pay raises for the troops. It's a very easy attack line. Um, you know, specifically, though, if every Congress would have had to have an up or down vote on whether or not to continue that post 9-11 AUMF, I guess, Secretary Armitage, do you think that that would have forced the political courage rather than the political cowardice in terms of punting on that NDAA, you know, to ask difficult questions? And, and conversely, even if the questions aren't that great, at least having the DOD have to sharpen its pencils and better articulate an argument for what the strategy is and where things are going. Congressman, my sense is that uh, you could have, there could have been a lot of tougher questions. Uh, I think most people in the, uh, in the uh, executive branch, after a while, start to view hearings as necessary. In fact, they like it because they come to feel that, wait, I know a pretty good bit about this subject matter, and so let's have at it. Uh, and that's a good, healthy attitude. I don't think reauthorization itself would have necessarily brought forth the desired result because of what I said to Congresswoman Spanberger, uh, that it, you don't, uh, I don't think the members of Congress themselves felt that strongly about Afghanistan. Now, Iraq, yes. That's a different, a horse of a different color. Thank you, Secretary. Um, you know, I, and, and I, I want to touch on some of the other panelists as well. Um, you know, it strikes me, um, and in General McMaster, um, I, I want to come to you on this. You know, I think there's this this belief, and it's gotten conveyed in the word sustainable, you know, that, that our lower troop presence was sustainable. And if we're looking at it uh, solely through the lens of American casualties, uh, then I think that's a very uh, appropriate understanding uh, viewed through the lens of, you know, Afghan National Security Forces casualties, which 2015 onwards on a per capita basis were equivalent to U.S. losses during World War II for the Afghan military. Uh, but, but I think more critically to how the conflict was portrayed, the civilian fatalities, which were quite high, even under the best of circumstances, when it was U.S. airstrikes that were conducting the majority of operations, uh, but then when that handed over to Afghan um, Air Force airstrikes, you know, really skyrocketed and uh, far less uh, constraints. How 
how do you look at civilian casualties in this war, especially considering the horrific bookend that we saw um, in the final days prior to the withdrawal with the killing of uh, you know, an aid worker for a U.S.-based NGO, uh, an SIV applicant, uh, and seven young children uh, in the strike that we, you know, that General Milley initially portrayed as a righteous strike? Uh, how do you think that impacted our perception and our ability to be effective uh, in achieving our objectives in Afghanistan? Well, of course, it has a negative effect. And I think the standard is juice and bellow. Through. You can't go wrong with Thomas Aquinas, right? I mean, it's it's about it's about it's about uh, discrimination and and proportionality. And what's not important is how many troops we have. I wish we would just stop talking about troop numbers. Who cares if it's 8,000 or 10,000 or 12,000? It'd make a difference if we were Ecuador, you know, but we're not Ecuador. What's important is, is what those troops are doing. And this is an important aspect of your question. If those troops are integrated, embedded with Afghan forces in a way where they can provide advice and bring our fires to bear in a precise manner until we can develop their capability to do that in a mature manner. That's what saves civilian lives and makes those forces much more effective. It was in the years that we said, hey, the Taliban's not our declared enemy anymore because we want to talk to them in Doha and sit across the table from those jackasses in Doha while the, while the, while the Taliban were continuing to commit mass murder attacks and killing our forces. We didn't have the Taliban as a designated enemy. We weren't even actively pursuing them. So we were always reactive, and then we weren't forward to be able to bring our firepower to bear effectively. So you, I apologize, I'm running low on time, but I, I greatly appreciate that answer. Just want to follow up with Ambassador Crocker real quick. Um, who do you think is more culturally in line with where the average Afghan civilian is, the, the Taliban or the, you know, the former Ghani government? Uh, the Ghani government is full of faults. Uh, but uh, given what we have already seen of uh, courageous demonstrations on the streets by women, for example, against the Taliban, uh, I would have to say the uh, uh, the previous administration, Ghani administration. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. Now you go back. Representative I am Wiles, here. I didn't hear you call on me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Now Ambassador Lude, I'm going to pick up where you just left off. Um, as we work to move forward with what Secretary Blinken has called a new diplomatic mission with respect to Afghanistan, what are the most important steps that we can take in coordination with our allies and our partners to convey to the Taliban the importance of protecting human rights especially the rights of women and girls. And I said, uh, what can we do to convey to them, but, but also what can we do to, to insist upon it? Well, I think uh, springing from one of the earlier comments, this has got to be a, a multinational effort. It can't just be the United States declaring its hand here. And we've seen some, some progress, some promising progress coming out of the Security Council uh, in the, at the UN, uh, out of a uh, preparatory meeting in the G20. Uh, G, the G7 should weigh in on this, and the administration should lead in this space this international set of demands that require the Taliban and actually hold the Taliban to the things that they've said they're going to do, but have not yet done. Um, and I think as the Taliban, I, I hope, as the Taliban settle into trying to govern Afghanistan under these very tough conditions, which we've outlined, that they recognize that they can't make it moving forward without international support. Uh, and we should withhold that support until they do what they say they're going to do. And we with, with the one exception, which Ryan Crocker has mentioned a couple of times, and that is to try to channel some assistance to the uh, humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people through the UN or through non-governmental organizations um, that doesn't get pilfered off by the Taliban. That's going to be very difficult, frankly. Um, my next I, question was my next question was going to be, do you think that it's possible to do that? I, and you've just said it'll be very difficult, but is it possible? It's it's going to be difficult, like over the horizon strikes are going to be difficult. Uh, but I think it's absolutely worth doing because, first of all, the Afghan people are going to continue to suffer. The previous uh, Congress uh, person mentioned civilian casualties and so forth. There are going to be a lot of casualties from humanitarian deficiencies in the in these upcoming winter months. And those casualties are going to be, I think, perceived globally as falling at our feet. 
Um, and, and I think there's a responsibility um, by this administration to step up and to lead the international effort to hold the Taliban to the fire and to do what we can responsibly on humanitarian assistance. I'm going to shift gears with you a little bit, Ambassador, um, and I'm, re I want to reference um, the extraordinary levels of corruption that were reported um, through the media, but based on extensive interviews with government and military officials. One that I found to be of particular interest was a December 2019 article by Washington Post journalist Craig Whitlock. Um, and the article outlines how, as a matter of policy, U.S. officials not only didn't combat or, or effectively combat corruption, but failed also to confront a more distressing reality that it was, in fact, responsible for fueling the corruption by doling out vast sums of money with lim limited foresight or regard for the consequences. Um, media reports from 2013 uncovered that Afghanistan's first president following the overthrow of the Taliban, President Karzai, was on the CIA's payroll, allegedly personally receiving millions of dollars in cash. In your view, were those sorts of practices compatible with building strong and independent institutions in Afghanistan? And if not, what was the agenda being advanced? Well, I think we've covered this in some of the some of the earlier questions. There was an effort um, which was uneven over years. So this was not a sustained flow of high uh, amounts of money, major major funds, but there was an off and on approach to to generate or to buy stability by way of funding uh, particular power brokers, the the famous warlords, and so forth. Uh, and to prop up the Karzai government in particular, but also the Ghani government uh, by way of funding. Um, I think that that the absorptive capacity of Afghanistan, however, uh, needs to come into play here. It was the fourth poorest country in the world, and we're introducing hundreds of millions of dollars uh, into uh, that economy. So I think to Ryan Crocker's previous point, that's a recipe for corruption. Um, and uh, I don't think we fully appreciated that or the depth of the corruption, even though there were honest efforts like the one that H.R. McMaster led uh, in Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. General Lady is back. I now recognize Representative Tom Melanowski of New Jersey, the vice chair of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I want to start by just quickly pushing back on uh, a comment that, that my friend Mr. McCall made at the very beginning of this hearing when he suggested that Trump's deal with Taliban was conditions-based and that President Trump would never have withdrawn uh, our troops, which I think is a pretty, pretty shameless uh, form of revisionism. Um, it, the, the conditions in that deal, as I think all of us here no, we're pretty much limited to the Taliban not shooting at our troops as we left, uh, alongside fairly vague and unenforceable promises not to uh, help al-Qaeda strike the U.S. homeland from Afghan soil. And, and I think we all know, uh, it's been widely reported that former President Trump was itching to withdraw and tried to withdraw, uh, even in the final days of his administration. There would have been no evacuation of Afghan allies. There would have been absolutely um, none of the effort that, that this administration made as inadequate as, as it was. Um, and so in light of that and many other things, though I've been very critical of the Biden administration in many respects, I, I do uh, sympathize with the dilemma that President Biden faced inheriting that terrible deal. Um, and, and, I, and I sympathize with the frustration I think he felt with the arguments that were most commonly made for staying in Afghanistan longer. It seems, to, from my experience, um, those arguments over three administrations made by the Pentagon, by former diplomats like myself, generally amounted to, Mr. President, give us, give us one more year, give us one more division, and we'll turn the corner. And I think President Biden was appropriately cynical of, of, of those kinds of arguments. The far better argument, I think, would have been essentially the argument that Ambassador Crocker uh, made today, that what we lacked was patience. What we needed was a recognition that just because we couldn't fix everything that was wrong with Afghanistan didn't mean that we had to sacrifice everything that was right. 
um, and that this was a problem that could have been managed over many years. As unsatisfying as that argument would have been, I think it would have been the right argument and the better argument. And and I wonder, Mr. Crocker, you know, you you served multiple administrations. Um, was that argument ever really made to any sitting president in, in a forceful way that we should just stay because that's what our interest demanded? Are you able to hear me? I'm having some audio yes. problems. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, to my direct knowledge. When uh, President Obama uh, asked me to go to Afghanistan uh, in a discussion before I left for Kabul, uh, uh, he told me what he wanted me to do. Uh, uh, two things, one tactical, uh, re repair the relationship with President Karzai, uh, as I had known him right from the beginning. Uh, and second, to negotiate a long-term strategic uh, with Afghanistan that uh, the president himself could come out to Kabul uh, and, uh, and sign. Uh, and he did so in May of 2012. Uh, the clear impression I got from him uh, at the beginning while we were doing these negotiations and, and when he came out to, to sign uh, was that the president was looking at this long term uh, that uh, subsumed in the uh, instruction on the agreement uh, uh, was the notion that uh, uh, we would be around whatever form might be uh, considered necessary by the governments. Uh, indefinitely. So I, I uh, came away from that and from my time in Afghanistan feeling that we uh, really did have a solid conditions-based uh, uh, approach that was then, uh, with respect to the security service forces in Afghanistan, that was then endorsed by the NATO summit in Chicago in May of 2012, just 10 days after the agreement was signed, in which uh, NATO committed itself to sustaining a force of uh, roughly 225,000 uh, Afghan troops uh, in the out years. So uh, right. I'm, I'm running out of time, case, so. I think, here of an ability to think long term. Yeah. Well, I guess, again, failure of patience. And, and I think, you know, I, I wish we had subjected our withdrawal to what I think should be always the test of any decision in American foreign policy. And, and that is, does it make us better off or worse off? I can think of about 12, 15, 20 ways in which the withdrawal and collapse of the government and victory of the Taliban has made us worse off. I can't actually think concretely of a single way in which it's made us better off. Um, our troops are still in the region conducting the same missions. They're not coming home. We've lost a counterterrorism partner. Perhaps the only benefit to the United States is that we're gaining um, tens of thousands of new Americans, Afghans who will be great Americans, but that is such a loss to their country and certainly not anything we would have wished. Thank you so much. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Sarah Jacobs of California, who's the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global uh, Corporate Social Impact for five minutes. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you to the witnesses. I think this conversation is incredibly important. Um, I wanted to start with you, Ambassador Crocker, um, since you've uh, one of the folks who have said and just answered in the last uh, question that, that we should have left troops in Afghanistan indefinitely. Uh, I wanted to first ask you um, some quick questions, if you could please answer in yes or no, so we could we could get to more um, since time is short. Um, the first is, do you believe that the terrorist threat emanating from Yemen is greater than it was in Afghanistan at any point over the last 20 years? I have no way of measuring that, uh, Congresswoman. I think it's significant in both countries. Okay, how about Syria or Somalia? Uh, uh, again, likewise, I have no basis uh, of knowledge in those countries. What I would say uh, is that it's theoretical in those countries. In Afghanistan, we were hit on 9-11 by Al-Qaeda, which is now returning, covered by the Taliban. 
Okay. Well, my analysis uh, uh, is that the threats emanating from these places are much more real than anything we've seen out of Afghanistan for at least the last 15 years, recognizing that obviously 20 years ago um, there was a, a horrific attack. And I sincerely hope no one is suggesting a military intervention and nation building exercise in any of those countries. Um, the reason I'm asking Ambassador Crocker is because I'm trying to understand why you believe that an indefinite continuation of this war is in the U.S.'s national interest. Um, September 11th happened when I was in middle school. My generation has been told our literally our entire adult lives that we're winning, that we're making gains, that all the military needs is more resources and more time, and that all this loss is worth it because it made us safer, despite multiple reports that concluded the opposite. So, um, you know, I know that there were talks of uh, strategic patience and uh, whether or not we're better off. I would say less civilians being killed right now uh, is better off. Uh, less of our military families that I'm very proud to represent being sent into harm's way means we are better off. But I, I want to ask now about some key decisions I think were determinative in this outcome. So first, uh, in 2001, the Bush administration rejected prospects for a negotiated settlement with the Taliban, and Donald Rumsfeld said an arrangement where Taliban leader Mullah Mohammed Omar could live, quote, in dignity would not be acceptable. Further attempts by the Taliban to join the political system were again rejected by the Bush administration in 2002. Secretary Armitage, uh, since you were uh, involved, seeing where we are today, do you believe that this was the right decision? Uh, well, I don't know about hindsight, Congresswoman, but I have to say that uh, we did give the Taliban an opportunity. I personally asked General Mahmoud to go see Mullah Omar at the president's behest. He did, and Mullah Omar turned us down flat. Second of all, uh, we did not, during the aforementioned bond process, we didn't even consider the Taliban because from our point of view, they were through. It was over. Uh, and so that's the reason we didn't try even to have a negotiated settlement. And from about 2005 on, it was quite clear that the Taliban themselves had come to the conclusion that we didn't have, uh, our lungs weren't big enough, our legs weren't long enough for the journey uh, that we were going to be on. Okay. Well, you know, I was uh, having my bat mitzvah in 2002, but from my estimation, um, after 20 years of fighting, we ended up with a stronger Taliban and a worse deal than what we could have gotten in 2002. And I know we've already gone over many other moments like this. Um, just lastly, you know, early on in our engagement in Afghanistan, it became clear that security interests took higher priority than other concerns, such as corruption, which I know many people have talked about today. Um, but in addition to corruption, we relied on local armed factions that may have been efficient militarily, but in addition to being corrupt, committed human rights abuses and traded narcotics. Uh, we know that in addition to this festering corruption, overlooking human rights abuses and failing to prevent civilian casualties from U.S. drone strikes directly enabled the Taliban's recruitment efforts. So again, after 20 years, we ended up with a stronger Taliban, a worse deal than we could have gotten before, and enabled terrorist recruitment, which is why we were supposedly there in the first place. And the entire time, we kept pouring money into this effort. I truly believe the Biden administration was right to leave, and I think we were all wrong to continue this effort as long as we did. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. General Lady yields back the balance of her time. I now recognize Representative Kathy Manning of North Carolina, who's the vice chair of the subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa, and global counterterrorism for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks and Ranking Member McCall for holding this very important hearing. I'd like to thank our witnesses for their service to our country, for appearing here today, and for staying until those of us at the end of the uh, ranking can ask, ask our questions. General McMaster, you have stated that administration after administration made fundamental mistakes that led to catastrophic results that we're now facing. In your opinion, are there fundamental flaws in our system that allowed these mistakes to be made? And if so, what changes do you think we need to make? Well, I, th I think part of it is the process that that uh, th uh, that uh, that delivers best analysis 
and intelligence and advice and options to, to the president. I think that what we have seen is the evidence of really the absence of fragmented strategies across time and inconsistent and fundamentally flawed strategies. And I think that uh, Representative Jacobs' uh, comment at the end is, is, is representative of what some people in the intelligence community thought, who became, I think, in many ways, apologists for the Taliban. They began to all, I mean, they kind of identify with, it's like the victim identifying with the abuser. So I think that there are elements of intelligence that has developed over time uh, that, that was based on wishful thinking and part of our self-delusion. But I think it's the overall process that integrates all elements of national power. How could it be that our policy would be to, to, to announce the schedule for our withdrawal and then enter into a negotiation with our enemy to go back and to what expect, you expect anything else than what we got? Thank you, sir. But you said you just said that we have a friend. There's a problem with the fragmented way that information is is conveyed to the president. How would you? Ch is there a structural change that needs to be made to to avoid that fragmented fragmented presentation of evidence? Or I presentation think there's a I think there's a process that can be put in place that that can help the president make the best decisions. I think we put that in place from 2017 to 2018. I think that's why President Trump made the decision he did for a sustainable long-term commitment in the August 2017 speech he gave on the South Asia strategy. I but believe, but, but I, I believe the process, the process didn't work because then he turned around and did no, what you said. You're absolutely right. It turned out to be unsustainable. It turned out to be unsustainable. And so ultimately, I think it's not a process. It's, it, it's leadership. We, we are now, we often lament that, hey, most Americans don't support a sustained effort in Afghanistan. Well, that should not be surprising when three presidents in a row told the American people it's not worth it and we should prioritize withdrawal uh, over a sustained commitment. And so compare our withdrawal and what that brought about to what we were preventing. And, and, and I, I think that... Uh, you know, with uh, Representative Jacobs as well for her her points. I mean, I, I think that was it worth it? What did we achieve? I think it's apparent what we're achieving now as we see the freedoms of, of the Afghan people extinguished and a jihadist terrorist state being reestablished in Afghanistan. Thank you, sir. Uh, I appreciate that. Ambassador Crocker, you stated in response to Chairman Meek's questions at the beginning of the hearing that with 2,500 troops in Afghanistan, we could have managed that situation def indefinitely. And I want to make sure I understand, are you suggesting that leaving 2,500 troops literally indefinitely would have been the best way to deal with Afghanistan? And could the U.S. have then maintained the, the status quo in F indefinitely? And what would have been the long-term duties of the U.S. military? The long-term duties would have to... Uh uh, themselves evolve over time and changing conditions. The commitment I was talking about, and by the way, I, I said 2,500 is probably too small, uh, but I take uh, uh, General McMaster's point. We don't need to be talking about numbers, but about missions. We had not been involved in combat operations for uh, over a year and a half. Uh, we were doing special ops, and we were doing um, uh, advise and assist uh, that is the kind of mission, I think, that uh, was indefinitely sustainable. And it, uh, again, as I said, the Taliban controlled not a single provincial capital when we had 110,000 troops, and they still didn't control a single provincial capital when we had 2,500. Let me ask you one more question. Uh, you stated in response to Ranking Member McCall uh, that we said we would have the back of women and girls who took up the call to get an education and develop careers, and instead we left them behind. Are you suggesting that we should be allowing all Afghan women and girls who can leave come to the U.S.? Uh, certainly not, Congresswoman. Um, but it is, uh, it is something that literally gnaws away at me. Maybe it was all just a mistake to even start with girls' education. Maybe it was a major mistake not to encourage women to enter the political process, knowing that our, uh, our presence was a, a, something of a guarantee that they could do so positively and not lose their lives. Uh, so um, that, that, that is the burden I have to carry, and I would hope that some of the uh, folks who make political decisions back in Washington uh, without benefit of uh, actually seeing these women and girls face to face, um, might also feel a little bit sorry right now. My time has expired. I yield back. Gentle lady yields back. I see Congressman Costa. Mr. Costa, do you have a question? You're not going to answer five minutes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the ranking member for this important hearing. I think it's 
uh, very significant for the American people and for the future of our committee that we provide the oversight on the 20 years that we spent in Afghanistan. And in listening to the testimony, and I want to thank the four witnesses for your service to our country, it's very clear uh, that um, uh, what we had is inconsistencies on goals uh, and expectations um, and, and, and the policies that were uh, implemented over four administrations to try to obtain those goals. And uh, your definition, uh, Mr. Armitage, about uh, definition of, of going crazy, I think is applicable here. Um, you know, uh, let's let's the examples that were used previously about uh, successes in other parts of the world, whether it be South Korea, uh, parts of South America, others. Um, I think we need to keep in mind that in many of those instances, uh, there were proxy wars. There was a reason why we stayed in the long haul in South Korea, uh, as well as Taiwan, and and the fact that South uh, America is a part of our going back to the mud and roll doctrine, our own. Uh, neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, uh, Ambassador Crocker, I first met you in Pakistan back in 2005, and then again later on in Iraq. Uh, many of us have had multiple trips in that part of the world. I clearly early on <laughs> determined that we cannot look at through this through the lens of the American eyes. Um, need to understand in that part of the world that it's first family, then tribe. Uh, tribe determines religion. Uh, and corruption is a constant. I told Prime Minister Maliki when we first met him in 2006 how he was going to try to create institutions of democracy when if, uh, with dear uh, <laughs> patience, that uh, corruption in his part of the world, if not endemic, was a way of life, which it is. Um, and so, um, you know, I remember in a meeting with Karzai, him uh, discussing American elections in 2008, and, and, and the Republican and Democratic race. And he said, you know, I could only wish that maybe someday a Tajik could get elected president to Afghanistan. Uh, it gets back to family, tribe, religion, and the corruption as the constants and how we dealt with that. So what is the, for the four of you, uh, the lessons to be learned from all of this? Um, I thought we could be successful in Afghanistan if we were uh, willing to commit as we have for South Korea, uh, you know, uh, 50 years, we still have 26,000 troops in South Korea. Uh, but the, the same emphasis as a proxy war just, I don't think, is, is relative to the American people to be sustained politically at home. So what are the lessons learned, my friends, um, as with your vast experience? Mr. Crocker, Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I think I learned maybe two important things in almost 40 years in the Foreign Service. One of them is be careful what you get into. Uh, if that is a military involvement, um, because you will see consequences not just of the third and fourth order, but of the 30th and 40th order, things you cannot possibly predict. Uh, the second is be careful what you get out of, that um, the consequences of uh, withdrawing can be as great or greater than the consequences of your original intervention. Well, that gets uh, to the Powell Doctrine in terms of if you go in, you better have a, a get-out strategy. Uh, Ambassador uh, Lute, lessons to be learned. So, so Congressman, uh, in short, uh, set realistic objectives. Uh, be ready to generate the resources that those objectives require. Don't over-rely on the military alone. This whole notion of counting troops and so forth has proved to be counterproductive. And then um, generate the alliance support so we're not doing this by ourselves. Ambassador Armitage. Congressman, it seems to me there are several. First, there's the effect the my enemy's enemy is not necessarily my friend if they don't share our general values. Second, it seems to me uh, that uh, we've got to make a determination if there are things that others can provide or can only we provide it in a, in a given situation. And third and last, uh, it seems to me that um, that we have to make a decision elected members, the public, can American boys or can local boys, whatever nation it is, carry rifles as well as American boys? And if the answer to that is yes, then maybe you ought to slow down. Well, thank you. Uh, Ambassador uh, uh, McMaster, or Ms. <laughs> my time's expired, but you talk, I talked about inconsistencies. There was inconsistencies within the administration you served. How do you avoid that? 
Time well, for the gentleman has expired. Okay. I now recognize Representative oh, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania, who's a ranking member of the Subcommittee on Europe, Energy, the Environment, and Cyber for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists for being with us today. Um, I wanted to start with uh, uh, Mr. McMaster. Um, uh, clearly, you have a ton of experience in this realm, sir. I just want to um, focus on the the, the Bagram-based uh, issue and what possible, if any, and there's not going to be any replacement for sure, what are our options? And if you could talk about the whole Blinkless Eye uh, drone program to the extent you can in this setting and where we're launching them from now and how much flight time requires uh, to and from the targets over uh, all the areas that we were covering on uh, Bagram, China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, and obviously Afghanistan. Um, what, what is our, how much has our capability been diminished and how can we possibly make up for that? It's, it's, it's been diminished significantly because, as you mentioned, there, there's much less time on station and, and many uh, much fewer sorties that you can that you can launch to, to really conduct the kind of surveillance and intelligence collection. But also when we left Afghanistan, <laughs> we gave the airspace to the, to a jihadist terrorist government. And I don't think anybody's talking about that at all. I mean, how are we going to routinely access that airspace? Uh, is that going to even be practical or, or will this administration have the will uh, to do so forcefully if necessary? So I think we've, we've lost a great deal more access than we're admitting to not only from a, you know, from our, 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 our friends who we abandoned there, the Afghans who were the best intelligence collectors from a human intelligence perspective, uh, but also our access to be able to collect um, collect surveillance and communications intelligence as well. And where are we launching from now, sir? Is it all from the Gulf states? And if so, what percent of the, of the energy source of the drone is consumed purely by travel time? I think that's a better a better question for obviously the Department of Defense. But, you know, they we we uh we launched that, those surveillance capabilities based on the type of aircraft from many different locations. And is there any, uh, what, what would be the next best thing for us that's reasonable for us to acquire through a cooperative agreement um, to have a presence in the region? You know, I just don't know enough about, about it and who would be willing to provide that, you know, to, to provide that access. You know, of course there are, sec there are risks for those who, who host us now. And I think part of the problem is a, uh, is a belief that that maybe we we're not in it for the long haul, uh, and we would abandon whoever whoever we partner with it, in a way similar to the way we abandoned Afghanistan. And so you were obviously familiar with the previous administration's plan with regard to Afghanistan. Did the withdrawal plan in any way resemble what we saw manifest before our eyes over the past few months? So I left in April 2018, and and the South Asia strategy that President Trump had put in, which I think was fundamentally sound. And he made a very good decision from August 2017 was still in place. I don't know how that got unwound and why Ambassador Khalilzad was sent on a mission which resulted in, in capitulation to the Taliban in February of 2020. Uh, there will be others who will have had this ability on that. Maybe one of my two successors <laughs> as national security advisor in, in the Trump administration. And final question, sir. Uh, President Biden said that uh, nobody is more disappointed in our withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, than Russia and China, who he says would prefer to see us bogged down there. Uh, do you share that assessment? No, I don't share that assessment. I think China and Russia are both very happy that we get out. This has been one of Russia's talking points forever. It's been a part of their disinformation campaign. Most of Russia's disinformation campaign is oriented on dividing us over issues of race and immigration and gun control and reducing our confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes and in the outcome of elections. Uh, but but when there, when there were policy-related elements of Russia's disinformation campaign, they focused on trying to get us out of Afghanistan and get us out of Syria. And this is, I think, a really important point, you know, this idea that getting out of Afghanistan helps us in the area of great power competition. I think if you look at China's action, actions in South and Central Asia, they are trying to create the same kind of a exclusionary area there as they are in the South China Sea. And again, this is an area where Ambassador Crocker, I think, would be very well qualified to comment. Mr. Crocker? Um, in my experience, which is uh, now dated, of course, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, um, 
the, the view at that time was that the Chinese, it's not that the Chinese were doing too much, it was they were doing too little. Uh, they had the Guadar, the main contract on the Guadar port expansion in Pakistan, uh, and it committed to building rail and road links as part of that project uh, that would have improved the ability of the uh, uh, Pakistani government to communicate with its own provinces. They didn't build those roads and railroads. Similarly, in Afghanistan, with the copper concession they got, a stipulation was, again, roads and railroads that would allow, again, free movement of, of peoples and goods and security forces when necessary. They didn't do that either. Uh, so uh, while it, it may seem logical that they're trying to develop an exclusion zone, uh, they, they are actually you know, not doing the kinds of projects that would uh, increase their influence. Thank you, sir. General My time's Scott, expired. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize our last uh, questioner for the day, Representative Brad Schneider of Illinois, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do want to express my gratitude for calling this hearing, and I want to extend my gratitude to all of our witnesses, uh, also for your patience for staying throughout the, the entire session, but also in particular for sharing your insights and perspectives. Uh, I, I certainly feel we've learned a, a, a lot in this. Uh, before I begin with questions, I just want to note that uh, while I recognize and appreciate our government's extraordinary evacuation efforts, I remain concerned for those still in Afghanistan, as do all my colleagues. Uh, my office is not alone with numerous uh, pending cases, including SIV, humanitarian parolees, I-130s, and Afghans at risk. We've been in touch with uh, NGOs and private citizens who have been able to evacuate Afghans, and, and I'm looking forward for more information from our government and a timeline and plan for getting these individuals to safety as quickly and, and urgently as possible. And I uh, leave open the question perhaps for a future hearing on what we can do more in Congress to support these efforts. Uh, with the limited time I have left, uh, if uh, I can start with Ambassador Liu, uh, I uh, appreciate your definition of strategy as the alignment of ends, ways, and means over time. And you note as your first lesson the importance of a realistic picture of, of what's possible. Um, I did strategy, business strategy for my career before coming to Congress, and, and I appreciate understanding the history and the context of a situation uh, if you're going to have any idea of, of how to affect its, its uh, future direction. And so I guess my first question is, as a student trying to understand um, the root sources of, of the conflicts in Afghanistan, how far back do we need to go to begin that study? Is it back to 2001, 1979? Um, really prepare a strategy, how far do we have to go to understand uh, Afghanistan? Well, I, don't think there's a, I don't think there's a set answer, Congressman, for that question. But in Afghanistan, certainly the previous 10 years, uh, before 9-11, right? So that's the combination of the Taliban rule and the Civil War. Then the 10 years before that, which is the Soviet experience. But actually, we should have drawn deeper than that uh, because the... Afghanistan Constitution, I think, of 1964, turned out to be the basis of the Constitution uh, uh, outlined at the Bonn Conference. So I'm talking decades of experience, which often doesn't reside in the U.S. government, but it does reside. It, it resides in academia. It resides uh, elsewhere. It resides in other allies who have had deep uh, experience in the region. And, and that, that kind of breadth of expertise is what I would commend to uh, strategists in the future. Okay, so talking decades, and maybe I'll ask Ambassador Crocker, because, you know, the, the ethnic conflicts that uh, you know, affected, uh, and I forget who said it, the U.S. ignored ethnic uh, uh, issues and in, in assignment of responsibilities in the military. Don't you have to look back centuries and even further to understand Afghanistan in that level of detail? I, I think you can pick any number of starting points. Uh, uh, I would start with a century before moving on to centuries. Uh, a century ago was when the Brits lost the Third Afghan War and uh, Amanullah Khan um, uh, took power as the Afghan leader. He was a modernizer. Uh, uh, he moved out very fast. He got a lot done, uh, but a decade later, he was pushed out of power because he was moving too fast uh, for the uh, deeply conservative Afghan population. So it is understanding, I think, uh, some of these very deep-rooted uh, uh, 
beliefs and views of, of the population. So let me flip my question 180 degrees, Ambassador Crocker, because you used the term in your opening remarks about uh, strategic impatience. And if to understand the context of Afghanistan is certainly multiple decades, if not a century, how long is the patience necessary to affect the goals we were trying to achieve strategically as uh, Ambassador Lute described the strategy? How long were we needed to be, how long was our patience required? Decades, uh, another century? That's an excellent question in the context uh, to which I just spoke. Uh, in the roughly 100 year history of the modern state of Afghanistan, they have always required outside support. Um, uh, and they probably always will. And, you know, again, it, it does not need to be huge. Uh, it does not need to be measured in hundreds of American lives lost. Uh, but it is a reality of, of, of Afghanistan. It's um, past, present, and I dare say future that uh, it is going to require outside assistance. Great. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. I have decades, if not a century, of questions left, but they'll have to wait for another time. And I, I thank the witnesses, and I look forward to engaging in further conversations with all of you. Thank you. All of the time of the members have expired. Uh, let me first thank the extraordinary witnesses uh, for their uh, testimonies today. Uh, the testimonies heard today offer an insight into the 20 years of decisions and policies that have shaped the United States legacy in Afghanistan. And that legacy is a culmination of, in my opinion, mistakes, hubris, naive optimism about our ability to fundamentally transform a nation that we did not fully understand. There's only, there, there, there's, there's no one simple answer that alone can explain what went wrong on August 21st, I don't believe. The decision to withdraw, which I happen to strongly believe was the right one, was always, no matter when, whether it was 10 years, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, was always going to come with the risk of the Afghan regime collapsing, of chaos in Kabul, and a Taliban victory. Though we continue, we will continue to conduct oversight of that withdrawal. But there's no oversight is complete unless it also evaluates the years of policy making that got us there. What allowed us to transform what was a supposed to be a counterinsurgency strategy into one of nation building and to task our military with that impossible mission? I want to make a final observation based on some of the testimony submitted for today's hearings. Number one, Ambassador Crocker talked about often the fact that there was no provincial capital that was conquered by the Taliban, yet 70% of the country was still being contested by the Taliban during that period of time. And uh, it was also stated that our end goal for being in Afghanistan was always clear and never shifted, and that it was for the security of the United States. And yet, the closing statement was with the very heartfelt story of Ghazi Stadium and what our departure meant for the women of Afghanistan. So it, to me, it's a clear demonstration of competing interests and the lack of policy tools to deal with those interests, whether we are talking about counterterrorism or women's rights or girls' education, or corruption. Our military came to address the Al-Qaeda threat. We would have never been there otherwise. If there was not the Al-Qaeda threat, we would have never been in Afghanistan. But we stayed to prop up the Afghan government, and yes, support women's rights. To me, the latter two tasks should be entrusted to our diplomats and our development professionals, not the military. This choice is demonstrative of the mission creep that occurred, which made it so politically difficult to make the tough decision to finally leave. Now, I worry that lessons gained from looking back at the 20 years 
or at risk of being ignored. I worry that those who say Afghanistan could have been sustained missed the true lessons, I believe, of Afghanistan. Congress alone has the constitutional authority to declare war. And it is time it is once again takes seriously the weight of that responsibility. Not just shoving it off to the President of the United States. We are co-equal branch of government with oversight responsibility. And the only ones that be hearings to our oversight so that we can learn the lessons and not repeat the mistakes again. Because there are consequences of our actions here in the halls of Congress. Again, I've got to thank our distinguished witnesses for your honesty, for your patience, for your time, for your thoughts. And that's what we wanted here. You really gave us the, 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 the depth and the diversity of idea and thought that our committee need to hear. I thank you for your patriotism. I thank you for serving our great country. And I thank you for participating in today's hearing. Likewise, I want to thank Ranking Member McCall for his partnership in holding today's hearing, as well as all of the members of this committee for their engagement in this important conversation. So again, thank you all. And this hearing is now adjourned.